And anything before we start? No. All right, I'll call the jury down. Hello? Would you come down, please? Yes. Thank you. May I see you uh, for just one minute, Ms. Smith? We'll begin uh, with uh, another witness, Mr. Richards. Your Honor, Mr. Schrock, excuse me, handling this witness. Okay. We call Jacob Marshall. Stand, please. Raise your right hand. Do you sign me swear the testimony you're about to give in this matter be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but yourself again? I do. You may be seated. Sir, will you uh, state your name and spell your last name? My name is Jacob Marshall, uh, J-A-C-O-B-M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L. -L. And Mr. Marshall, do you know Gage Grosskreutz? I do. Would you say that he's a friend of yours? I would. And has he been a roommate of yours in the past? Yes. Okay. And when, from what period of time to what period of time were you guys living as roommates? Um... I want to say maybe three months up prior to the incident of, uh, I don't recall the exact night that happened, but uh, probably like three months prior to that, he was living with me up until. So if May. I said May of May of 2020, sound fair? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And after uh, August 25th, 2020, did you visit uh, your friend Gage Grosskreutz in the hospital? Yes, I did. And do you remember when you visited him? Um, the, f I believe the following day after the incident happened that night, um, I went to see him the next day as soon as I could get a hold of his family and stuff. So, yeah. And when you saw him, did you see him in um, Milwaukee? Yes. Okay. And um, <clears throat> you, you posed for a picture with him uh, in the hospital in Milwaukee. Is that right? Objection leading. Um. You know, it, it, we've heard that objection it, it, quite a bit during the trial, and the, 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 the suggestiveness is the offensive part of a leading question, and somehow I don't feel from what we've heard already that this is, he's going to lead this witness into an answer, so the objection's overruled. Did you take a photograph with him at the hospital in Milwaukee? Yes, we did. 
did you um, do you have a face or did you at the time have a Facebook account? At the time, yes. And after you took that photograph with Mr. Grosskreutz, did you post that photograph on your Facebook account? Yes, I did. I'm going to show you what has been marked as exhibit number 70 for identification. Mr. Marshall, can you take a look at that? Um, is that a picture of you and Mr. Grosskreutz? It is. Okay, and that's a picture uh, in the hospital that was taken? Yes. Okay. And I want you to look to the right of the photograph. Uh, there's some, uh, not that familiar with Facebook, but there's an entry that you made with your name and then some writing on it. Is that right? It appears so, yes. <clears throat> okay. So this is the Facebook post we're talking about, and tell me if this is fair. <clears throat> it says, I just talked to Gage Grosskreutz, too. Two. His only regret was not killing the kid and hesitating to pull the gun before emptying the entire mag into it. He said that to you, correct? No. He didn't say that to you? He never said that to me. You just posted something about your friend, your roommate, that was a lie? I did. Given the circumstances and all the threats I've received on the internet, I've never been put in a position like that. Um, addresses of ours were posted. Uh, you know, my mother was getting inbox, uh, my sister. It, it was insane with everything going on at the time. I made a bad remark. I was trying to stick up for my friend at the time who, you know, he didn't know any of this was going on. He didn't see the post or anything. Um, You're not sticking up for him. You're saying what he said. No. Hold on. This post down here should have killed him right then and there. That's you saying that, right? That is me saying that, yes. Okay. This post right here is you equating something that Mr. Grosskreutz said to you. I lied. He never said that. that those words have never came out of his mouth. I'm going to object, Your Honor. This is asked and answered, argumentative, and leading. Um, overall. So he never said that. You made it all up. 100% made it all up. Nothing else. Thank you. Mr. Marshall, after you learned that your roommate had been shot that night, what did you do? I actually went to Kenosha trying to figure out if he was alive. Um, uh, my sister was the one that notified me. She was watching his live stream. And, um, you know, I had to figure out if my friend was alive. Even at the time, I had no answers. So uh, I drove from Milwaukee to Kenosha to the first hospital. Uh, they were transferring him to a secondary hospital, which then he got flight lifted back to Milwaukee. So I basically drove down to Kenosha to drive back to see him in a freighter. But I wasn't able to see him until the following day, at least, I don't know, like 12 hours at least or plus after the incident happened. So, As you came down to Kenosha, you first went to uh, KMH or Freighter South looking for him. Is that right? Yes, it is. And you got there a few minutes after he'd been moved to another hospital in Kenosha. Is that right? Yes. I don't know the exact second hospital. It's like St. Mary's or something along those lines, something like that. And then when you went to that second hospital, you got there a few minutes after the helicopter had flown him all the way back up to Milwaukee. Yeah, I actually was watching him uh, get loaded into the flight for life. I kind of assumed it was him, and still I had no idea if he was going to make it. I didn't know the severity of things. I. And so then you drove back up to Milwaukee to freighter there to try and see whether or not your roommate was alive. Well, yeah, um, that was a goal, but like I said, uh, I wasn't able to get a hold of anyone. Uh, he was obviously anonymous at the hospital. Uh, I was just trying to get answers for his mom and his family to make sure, you know, I wasn't sure if my friend was going to make it or not. So I was just, you know, following him around, trying to figure it out. But you yeah, were, you were worried. You were scared. I've, I've never been in that position in my life. It was very traumatic watching, you know, my roommate, best friend get shot and like I said, I thought he was dead from the second of how everything played out. So, uh, yeah, I was very scared, very worried about everything. On top of being worried about his safety, you were also experiencing 
people putting his name on the internet, correct? Yes. And then all sorts of people who supported the defendant were making threats against him and you, correct? Yes, I actually believe uh, one of the guys I was sending threats was with the defendant that night. Um, his name is like Dustin Collette or something. He was sending pictures of guns to us. Uh, that was just a little thing. Uh, old addresses of ours got leaked out. Um, I was in th like fear for my family and fear for my friends. Like it was a, it was pretty crazy. So this post where you're talking about emptying a magazine was that your way of kind of trying to deter everybody from coming after you by letting them know that you guys are armed and ready to defend yourselves? That was 100% it. Gage has never said those words. I was trying to stick up for him more or less. That was, looking back, obviously not a good choice of words to say. Uh, I put in my emotions of, you know, what I wish would have happened. I, I guess you could say it that way that night. But those words never came out of my friend's mouth. I, when I seen them the next day at the hospital, I, you know, I, I cried. I was like, I'm so glad you're alive. Uh, kind of let them know, like, the severity of everything going on on social media. Uh, it was pretty wild. So, yeah. And it's fair to say that even in, even after that, in the, in the year, 14 months since then, you and Gage have continued to experience threats, harassment online, things like that. The second I got subpoenaed out of court on Monday, uh, instantly was already getting hundreds of messages friend requests from people i have no idea it, the the it still goes on to this day like it's it's insane is your friend gage the type of person who would take another life no and that's clearly shows of um, the objection is sustained gage is a medic he is a medic a paramedic and an emt yes Fair to say he's dedicated his life to preserving and healing other people. Yes, he cares about the wellness and safeties of others. Nothing further. Mr. Marshall, is this po you took this post down, did you not? After uh, getting all the harassment and stuff and instantly seeing that comment screenshot and knowing people are going to try to twist that right away, yeah, I took it down immediately. And <clears throat> you knew from this post can you bring up the post again you knew from the post because the picture on the bottom shows mr grosskreutz with a firearm right you see that i do okay so you out of anger or frustration you knew that if you said that that if his only regret was not killing the kid you knew that would hurt him right I did not at the time. Like I said, I was trying to stick up for my friend. Uh, it was a very hectic thing. I've never dealt with that situation like that. It was so bad word, bad judgment. So your method of sticking up for your friend, who you know is possessing a firearm, is to lie about something he said. Okay. And like I said, bad. I was say, like I said, it was going to be bad. It was a bad judgment, bad call on my part of even wording something like that and it was out of pure anger that's the really all I have Judge, I move 70. I have no other questions. any objection I have no objection to the exhibit and I have no further questions uh, you may step down sir received Your Honor, we would recall uh, animal kindry Uh, you're still under oath, sir. No. Okay. Um. And uh, the judge has told you that you are still in the Do you yes. understand that? Yes. And you, uh, do you recall testifying, uh, the state had called you as a witness back on uh, November 5th regarding this case? I don't know the date, but yes. Okay. And do you remember that I was asking you some questions regarding uh, the vehicles, the number of vehicles that had been damaged, mm -hmm. the amount of loss that your business had suffered? Mm -hmm and information regarding um, insurance, things of that nature. True, yes. 
And do you recall um, part of, and I've got a transcript, so I'll be happy to show you sure. uh, if you have questions about what you had said. Uh, do you remember me asking you uh, about the, uh, I asked this question, uh, can you give me a ballpark, meaning the amount of loss that your business suffered? And you had said that you couldn't remember. I asked you more than 100,000. You said yes. Mm -hmm. I said more than 250,000. And you said, I do not know, sir. Do you remember that? Yes. Um, do you remember saying, uh, being asked this question, and you don't know what the loss from those fires were? Your answer was, I personally never calculated it. My dad does the money part. Yes, right? yes. Is that true? Yes. That you still don't, you didn't know at the time what the loss was? Well, when we arrived on um, Monday, um, seeing all the destruction, all the cars, looking at the property, uh, because a lot of oil uh, has lost, it has gone into the asphalt, the soil replacement and all that. So, I mean, we were in shock. My question to you is, as you sit here today, are you still under oath stating that you don't know and didn't know what the loss was? i sorry, I cannot remember. You can't remember if that's your statement today? Could you repeat the question, please? On November 5th, you agree that you testified under oath you did not know what the loss was from your business. Restructure the question. I, where's Sister Marcian's pointer? This word order is not acceptable. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you recall testifying last week? Yes. And do you recall when you testified last week, mm -hmm. you were asked if you were aware of the total amount of loss to your properties? You remember that? Yes. And do you remember you testified under oath that you didn't? personally know what the loss was that you never calculated it. Right? I personally didn't. And is that your testimony today? At the time, I didn't know what the exact loss was. No, that's not the question. Answer Sorry. the question he asked, please. Sorry. Sorry, please, for the question. Are, is that your answer today, that you don't know what the loss was? I do have approximation what the loss was. And did you learn that from the last time you were in court till today? Yes. Okay. What is it? It was approximately $400,000. Okay. I'm going to show you, you provided an interview the day after this happened. Is that right? And I'll show you, tell me if you're on the screen. You guys remember, there's just all these cars turn the volume, exploding. Turn the volume off until we get there. What? It's double, there's double volume, so it's going to go like this. Please let her head go. Those are cars at your lot, right? At that time, yes. Is that your brother? Yes. Okay. Uh, so is this, is, oh, is, this, is, this, is that you? Yes. Okay. You play it? And uh it's it's yeah. Is it a tent to hear this? Yes. Yeah. Well I can't. Now I've I got my sinus your plug, but uh, can other other people hear it? No. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't think that would control this. It, 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 I think it's going to be earlier in the system. Because it should be coming. Yeah. We'll just, they couldn't hear it, so if it stayed right there, just hear it. I can't play it at the same time. I apologize. 
don't know how to make I it. I can't hear it. I, I can't hear you. Um, I would think because uh, it is, I thought, connected into the system here. Have you got ours all the way up? Uh, is there any place where it's coming in clearly? Are you getting it clearly? Can you hear on those that we turn that TV on, the volume on that TV? If we turn the mics off, that might work. The volume's up to seven. Is anyone getting it clear, clearly? Let's let's talk. So this is this is your business, and um, this obviously is, is is affecting you pretty hard. We built this place up just now. Yeah. When we, we started this business back in 2013, only about five to seven cars. Seven cars. I counted the first day we had only seven cars. Seven cars. Yeah. Do you do you feel like right now with this with this? That you're still Kenosha bound, you're gonna stay here in Kenosha and rebuild. Probably not. Well, the thing is, if, if there's no government funding or if there's no help from anybody, I'm not because yeah. there's nothing I can do. I mean, uh, in order. You just said to him, if there's no government funding for this, there's nothing we're gonna be able to do, right? I must have, I don't remember saying that. You're not disputing, you said it. I must have. Run a business, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of people, a lot, it takes a lot of, a lot of effort. We have to build the capital first to reinvest it. Yeah. We would have been at least so happy that, okay, we lost only five cars. Ten. Fifteen. Okay, max twenty. Okay, twenty-five. How many cars are lost total, you know? In total? Yeah. In uh, all three locations? Yeah. 137. 137. 137 cars. Yep. Yeah. Mm. I heard that there was at least one point five million dollars in the damage. That was the first just two point five in total. Just like three wow. Two point five million in total. Mm -hmm. That's what you said to him the day after, right? I must have. Well you heard it, right? Yes. So when you said four hundred thousand today, mm -hmm. is that a lie? It's not a lie. It's uh, what it is is uh when we like I said, when we saw that uh, from in our eyes, we were in shock. Okay. To that be able to, I'm sorry, uh, to be able to how to come back from it, uh, we were taking everything in consideration in terms of all the oil, the gas has gone into the asphalt, uh, the DOR. Uh, so we're basically putting everything in the consideration to get back on track. That's. Understand that. Mm -hmm. But I want you to answer my question. Go ahead. My question was, when you testified today under oath that your loss was 400000 you'd agree that's not what you said on the tape, right? That is correct. So what you testified today under oath, that's a lie, right? It was a mistake. Today? Last time, but in the video. The $2.5 is the mistake. Yes, because we were in shock. So where would you come up with that number? Like I just explained to you, um, over the property loss, the building, the roof, the glass, um, we didn't know. We, looking at the condition of the lot, I mean, you can clearly see it, uh, the asphalt, uh, the soil contamination, there's DOR involved, so it, that stuff is not cheap, so we were just approximating it that that's probably how much it's going to be for us to be back on track. He, he asked you that he said that he heard it was a million or a million five, right? And then you corrected him and said, no, it's 2.5. Well, that's what I said because of the DOR and uh, they, they, we have to, I, we knew we had to go through the permits again and stuff like that. So I didn't have, it was just the number that was out there with me being in shock uh, of the damages that has occurred to my dad's business. You knew the specific number of cars, right? 
um, I didn't remember on last week, but now it, yeah, now it says there. And it's 137. I cannot remember what it was in total. Okay. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Oh, I would, Judge, I'm sorry. That was marked as 136 exhibit, and I would move that. Objection? No. Proceed. Cross? Mr. Kindry, the video that we just saw, mm -hmm. do you remember what day that was? I honestly do not. Do you remember what day all of those cars burned? The, this video, it seems like that was early Monday morning. Um, people said Sunday night the lot burned. But when we came to find out, it was Monday early morning in between 12.30 to o'clock. I just want to make sure we're clear about what we're talking about, Mr. Sure. Kindry. We, we looked at this map when you testified on Friday, and the video we just saw is at this location, the car source on the northeast corner of 59th and Sheridan, correct? That is correct. And that is the lot that burned around 2 in the morning on Monday morning. That is correct. All of that damage had been done a couple days before the shootings where Mr. Rittenhouse killed people on the night of Tuesday, August 25th. That correct? is correct. And your interview there that we just watched is what, maybe six or eight hours after the cars had all burned? Uh, honestly, I don't remember what the time or the day it was. When that property burned, mm -hmm. it wasn't just the cars, it was the building too. Exactly, yes. There was uh, records, computers, yes. business files inside that building yes. that were destroyed or damaged. Yes. Did that make it hard for you as a bi or your family to figure out all of your business inventory, the property value, things like that? Very hard, yes. Is it fair to say that six or eight hours after the incident, you didn't have a clear picture of the full value of your cars. That is correct. I have nothing further. You didn't have a clear picture on November 5th either, did you? Uh, of, of this year? I did not. Nothing else? Everybody, give me a step down. Nice to call Kyle Rittenhouse. Um, we need to do something to take about five minutes. Uh, can you uh, uh, step out just into the library here for a sec? Anybody wants to go upstairs may do so, but this will be less than five minutes, I'm expecting. <coughs> Your lawyer has called you to testify as a witness in this case, and uh, I just want to advise you what your rights are. You are allowed to testify if you wish under the Constitution, and no one can keep you from testifying, even your own lawyer, if that's what you want to do. 
if you do decide to testify, then the district attorney will be allowed to cross-examine you about anything that is relevant to this case. And that, uh, are there any claimed uh, prior in, uh, untruthful statements? 90608. Um, what we've had testimony regarding the things he said about not shooting anyone. Other no, no, no. I'm talking about uh, prior prior instance of dishonesty under 90608. No. Okay. Uh, so, so that's not an issue. The district attorney will also be allowed to ask you if you've got any criminal history or juvenile adjudications. Are there any of that? Not aware of any. Okay. And uh, you could be um, asked about any other crimes, wrongs, uh, or prior events that uh, I've, I think I've ruled on everything that's been uh, presented to me. You have uh, left the door open on some things, Your Honor. Yeah, and I've been thinking about it, and nothing, uh, I've not heard anything in the case that would suggest to me that I would change any of those rulings. So, um, so um, unless there's something else on that, uh, I don't need to cover that in terms of a possible inquiry. He will be able to ask you anything which is relevant to this case, germane, pertinent to this case, and you will have to answer those questions, even though it may ensnare you in some other criminal prosecution. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. Any question about that at all? No, Your Honor. You also have a right not to testify if you don't wish to do so, and if you decide that you do not wish to testify, then um, no comment will, can be made on your silence by the district attorney. And I will not comment on your si comment on your silence unless I am asked by your attorney to do so. And the only comment that I would make on it if I were asked to do so would be to instruct the jury that the defendant in a criminal case has the absolute constitutional right not to testify and that your silence should not must not be considered by the jury in any manner in deliberation or in reaching their verdict. Do you understand that? Yes, Your Honor. So that'll be a choice that I'll, I would uh, ask uh, Mr. Uh, Sharofsky or Mr. Um, Richards at a later point uh, as to what you wanted to do if you decided not to testify, but that won't be an issue if you decide that you do want to testify, okay? Yes, Your Honor. Any question about this at all? No, Your Honor. Have you had enough time to discuss this matter with your lawyers? Yes, Your Honor. Have you had enough time to think about what you're doing? Yes, Your Honor. Do you think what you're doing is the best thing under all the circumstances? Yes, Your Honor. Has anybody threatened you or pressured you or forced you in any way with respect to this decision? No, Your Honor. Has anybody promised you anything in exchange for this? No, Your Honor. Is your mind clear today? Yes, Your Honor. Are you feeling all right? Yes, Your Honor. Have you had anything alcoholic to drink today? No, Your Honor. Have you had any drugs or controlled substances of any kind within the last 24 hours? No, Your Honor. Any reason I should not accept his uh, waiver? No, Your Honor. This is consistent with advice of counsel. Okay. Any I'm not aware of any reason. Okay. All right, then. Anything else? May I just have a moment to run back to my office real quick? I'll be back in two minutes. Sure. Thank you.
Rush to come back in, please. Maybe see it. Can I ask you to stand, please, and raise your right hand? Do you sign swear the testimony you're about to give in this matter be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. You may be seated. Could you please state your name, spelling your last name for the record? Kyle Rittenhouse, R I T T E N H O U S C. Kyle, where do you reside? Walworth County. How old are you? 18. On August 25th of 2020, did you come to downtown Kenosha to look for trouble? No. Would you have shot Joseph Rosenbaum if he hadn't chased you trying to take your firearm? Objection, leading. I uh, sounds kind of leading. Would you, I'll get to it. Are you a high school graduate? Yes. What high school? Penn Foster Online High School. Are you currently enrolled in any further studies? I'm a college student studying nursing at Arizona State University. Do you, who do you currently live with? My mom and two sisters. Directing your attention to August 25th of 2020, where did you reside? Antioch, Illinois. Do you remember the address? 286 Anita Terrace, apartment 104, Antioch, Illinois. And who did you live with there? My mother and two sisters. What's your father's name? Michael Rittenhouse. Back on August 25th of 2020, where did he reside? He lived in Kenosha, in, in the city of Kenosha, behind, in the apartments behind the pick and save on 50th, on 50th. Do you have any other family that's from Kenosha? Yes. What? My grandmother, my aunt, my uncle and cousins all live in the city of Kenosha. Okay, there's been testimony in this trial about the firearm in question, which has been marked. Nah, I don't know. Um, states 28. You've seen that gun? Yes. Before August 25th of 2020, had that gun ever le left the state of Wisconsin? No. Now. Before this event happened on August 25th of 2020, did you have any hobbies? Yes. Tell the jury what you like to do. I was a swimmer. Um, I enjoyed working. I was a lifeguard, um, hanging out with friends, going to the beach, just normal teenage stuff. Were you a, were you a member of any groups, organized groups? Yes. What? I was a police explorer for Grays Lake Police Department, and I was a firefighter EMT cadet for Antioch Fire Department. Did you have any training in um, life-saving, anything like that? Yes. What? I was a certified lifeguard. I was a certified, I, I am a certified lifeguard and swim instructor. I am certified in Stop the Bleed, CPR, AED, Automatic External Defibrillator. Um, and basic life support. Okay. On August 25th of 2020, where were you employed? I was, empl I was furloughed at the YMCA in Lindenhurst, Illinois because of the COVID-19 pandemic and I was working at the RecPlex in Pleasant Prairie. Okay. RecPlex here in Kenosha County? Yes. Now, 
On the night of the 24th, did you come to downtown Kenosha? Not downtown, but I came to Kenosha for work. Okay. And after you were comp your shift at work completed, where did you go? I went to Dominic Black's stepfather's house. Um, I believe his name is Scott Dickhart. It's been a while since I've seen him. Okay. And who is Dominic Black in relationship to you? Uh, that um, him and my Dominic Black and my sister Mackenzie Rittenhouse used to date. Okay. And on the night of the 24th, were you aware of anything going on in Kenosha? I, I knew there was uh, protests, demonstrations, and riots going on in the later evening. Okay. And how were you aware of that? I saw videos on social media, um, on Facebook live streams, TikTok of... Um, I, I saw the car source lot being burned down, the car source one, what we've been referring to. Um, I saw a police officer get assaulted. He had a brick thrown at his head. Um, and I saw the mattress store owner get knocked out, and I believe his jaw was broken and it had to be wired shut or something. And, and you saw all of that on the 24th? Yes. Did you go to downtown Kenosha at that time and try and do anything about that? No, I did not. Directing your attention to the late morning of August 25th, 2020, did you have occasion to go downtown? I did go to downtown in the morning of August. Who did you go there with? I went there with Dominic Black, my sister Mackenzie Rittenhouse, and Ray Dickhart. And describe what you did. Uh, we walked around for a little bit, and then I believe at around 11.30 noon, we ended up at Ruther Central High School, where we ended up cleaning graffiti for about, I want to say, an hour and a half to two hours. Previously marked as Exhibit 131. Do you recognize that? I do. Could you describe what you see in that photo? Um... Towards the left in the olive green shirt, that's me. And then to my left, that's Ray Dickard. And to my right, that's my sister Mackenzie Rittenhouse. And what are you doing there? We're cleaning graffiti off of Ruther Central High School. And were you getting paid to do this? No, I was not. And you see what the graffiti says? Yes. And you do what it said as you were cleaning it off? Yes. I won't repeat it. After you were done doing that, what did you do? Uh, we we were, we went to the car source lot, the first location, and um, we we were looking at the destruction of the burnt cars, and we we saw the owner Sam and Sal, I believe that's what they told us their names were. And you saw when we say car source, the one that you met Sam and Sal at is what we've been referring to as car source number one. Yes, and that's the one. Have you just played a video of a lot of burnt out cars? Yes. Did you have any discussions with Sam and Sal? Uh, briefly, um, I offered my condolences and I said, if there's anything I can do, please reach out to me. He gave me his number. Um, I gave him my number. And, and you were with Dominic Black at that time? I was. And your sister? Yes. And what did you do after that? Um, after that, we walked back to, I believe, we parked their car by, you see the parking lot? Do you have the pointer up there? Yes. We parked our car right out of that corner, somewhere you're, over there. I can't see that far, I'm sorry. You're referring to the parking lot, which is uh, at the corner. Sheridan East Park. Correct. And you had Eighth Street, correct? Yes. Okay, you can put the pointer down. And whose car did you get there in? Dominic Black. We the parking lot. We went to Black's stepfather's house again and we hung out there for a little bit. Okay. And And did you have any that? Evening around 3.34, Nick Smith called me and Dominic. And when he called you, what was the nature of the call? 
At first, Nick Smith wanted us to drive him to Chicago by, not Chicago, by O'Hare Airport, the sub suburbs of Chicago, because he wanted to buy a, buy a bulletproof vest. And we said, Dominic said, okay, we'll drive him. And then he said, okay, I need you to pick us up, me up at like 3.30, 4 o'clock. Okay. Did you go and pick him up eventually? Yes. Uh, we actually, before we picked him up, we went to Jelensky's. Okay. What did you do at Jelensky's? We bought, um, Dominic wanted me to buy uh, two rifle slings. And did you? I did. One was for what? One was for my rifle, and the other one was for Dominic's rifle. Okay. And why did you care about your rifles that evening? Um, the reason for the slings were just so it's like a, a, ret a retainer, so if I'm helping somebody with first aid, I can just like dangle my rifle behind me, and I don't have to worry about somebody just randomly going and picking it up off the ground, just as like an extra measure so it won't be taken from the ground. And what time did you go to Jelensky's? I want to say about 2.30, but I don't know exactly for sure. Okay. When did you first have contact with Nick Smith? Uh, oh, 3.30. 3.15. Three, eh, 3 okay. 3.15, 3.30. And was there any discussion regarding car source at that time? Yes. What? Um, Nick Smith, once we picked him up, we drove, he wanted to go to a bank to withdraw money. The bank was closed, and then he was like, hey, would you guys like to come with me and help watch over the car source, make sure there's no fires or anything? And Dominic said, yes, I, I agreed. I said, okay. And then I said, here, Nick, I don't, I don't really need my bulletproof vest. I'm going to be helping people with first aid, so I gave him my bulletproof vest. And by you giving him your bulletproof vest, did that stop the need to go to someplace by O'Hare Airport? Yes. Okay. And why does a 17-year-old kid have a bulletproof vest? It was issued to me by the Grays Lake Police Department. Okay. You didn't purchase it? No, I did not. And after you gave him your bulletproof vest, where did you go? Uh, we went back to uh, Nick Smith's house where we parked Dominic Black's car. And then what did you do? We walked from Mr. Smith's house um, once we parked at Nick Smith's house, we walked from Nick Smith's house to the car source one, cutting through the Ruther Central backside parking lot because Nick Smith lives on the same street of. You don't have to say where Nick Smith okay. lives. He, he lives within walking distance from here? Yes. Okay. And so you go to car source one? Yes. And that's the burnt out one? N uh, no, car source two, my bad, across the street. Okay. And at Car Source 2, that's where you spent most of the evening? Yes. Okay. When you first got to Car Source 2, the one at 59th and Sheridan, what happened? Um, the owners were there, Sam, Sal, and his father. And I believe, I, I think it was his uncle there also. He was driving a, a van of some sort. Okay. And what, what was the discussion? Sam and Sal thanked us for coming out to help. Um, and then he said, Sal said, hey, why don't you guys hop in my car? I, if I remember correctly, it was either a white or black BMW or Mercedes. I don't, I don't recall exactly. And why did he want you to get in his car? Um, he was going to drive us down to car source lot number three. Okay. And did you agree to get in his car? I did. And who went to car source number three? Me, Dominic Black, and Nick Smith. And who was driving? Sal. And when you got there, what happened? We got out and um, we hung around for a couple minutes and then some people showed up. Um, I now know who they are, but at the time I didn't. Okay. Show you what's been marked as exhibit 330. Do you recognize that exhibit? I do. And can you, Your Honor, can I? Can you go up there, please, and point out? 
can you point out the people who you knew before that picture was taken and name them? Yes. This yeah. is This is Sal, the owner. This is Ryan Balch. This is Joanne Fiedler. This is Justin Hamilton. This is Dustin Colette. This is Nicholas Smith. I don't recall his name. This is me, and this is Dominic Black. We've heard testimony, you can have a seat. We've heard testimony about you, Nick, and Dominic. You, you knew those individuals before August 25th of 2020? I knew Nicholas Smith and Dominic Black. Okay. You did not know the owner of Car Source previously? I did not. Was he being nice to you guys? Was he happy you were there? Was he mad at you for being there? Describe it. He was happy we were there. Okay. And you heard his, their testimony, the two owners, I believe that was Friday afternoon? I did. And did they give you permission to be there? They did. And the other individuals in this photograph, some of whom have testified in this trial, 10 minutes before this photograph was taken, did you know any of them? I did not. Had you ever spoken to any of them? No. And when you were there, what was the idea? Was there a plan? What was going to happen? Uh, yes, the plan was to, I, I went down there to provide first aid. I also, I, I brought my um, orange first aid kit, the fanny pack, and I also brought my pelican box, which, had, which was filled with first aid stuff by my feet to provide first aid. The orange box by your feet you refer to as a pelican box? Yes. Did you have that before the 25th? Yes. Was it stock? Yes. With things that you had bought and brought? Yes. And do you go with that every day, or is that because of the situation? It was in the trunk of my car. Okay. And the fanny pack, what's the situation with that? It was my work bag. Um, I brought it to work with me, and I would put it under my lifeguard booth. Okay. And that had first aid supplies? Yes. Now, after the meeting here at 63rd and Sheridan Road, what's been referred to as Car Source 3, what happened? Um, after the photograph, um, I believe, I, I don't recall exactly, but there was about two or three vans that pulled up, like big vans with people inside of them. Okay, and what was their role in this evening? Well, they showed up and they wanted to protect the business and I didn't really have a say in what everybody was doing. I was just there doing my first day stuff. And then Ryan Ball said, hey, why don't you guys stay here? Um, and we'll go down to the car source number two. Okay, and so the people, a group of people was gonna stay at car source three and the people depicted in this photograph were gonna go where? Car source two. And is that what happened? Yes. And so at that point then, Sam and Sal had coverage, for lack of a better word, at both of their businesses to protect the property, correct? Yes. So you get down to car source two, did all of these people go there? Yes, besides Sal, the owner, he did not. Okay. During the night, was Sam and Sal there? They were not. They left you guys there? Yes, I, I believe Nick Smith was in contact with them throughout the night. I'm not certain, but I believe they were. And you get down there, were you able to get in and out of the business? Yes. How? Uh, Sal, the owner, actually gave Nick Smith a set of keys. Did you personally see that? I did. Did he give you any other direction regarding any equipment or anything like that? He let us know where, like, the power washers and the fire, I think there was a single fire extinguisher in the building and some hoses, uh, the hose hookups, just in case there was any fires we needed to put out at the lot. Anything else about uh, the roof? He showed the, I believe it was Dominic Black and Nick Smith, the two ladders that were there to get up on the roof. Okay, and did you guys use those ladders? I didn't personally, but the people that were on the roof did. Okay, and you saw them use those ladders? I didn't see them, but I, that's how they got up there. Okay, did 
where were you predominantly at Car Source too? I was in front of the Car Source too. Now, during the night at Car Source Two, did you stay there the whole time? No. Time. When you would leave Car Source Two. and we would go ask if anybody needed any first aid assistance and we would see if there were any fires and we okay did you personally put out any fires I did where I put one out at the church um, can you use a pointer um, so right here was where there was the demolishing they were breaking some stuff down but right here, I believe there was another building with an alleyway. It was either right here or right here. I don't remember um, fully. But there was a fire um, down the alleyway where they were trying to set the building and church on fire. And me and Mr. Balch, and I believe somebody else was with us, we went to go put that fire out. Did you put it out? We did. Then what did you do? Uh, we, around that time, we saw Ruther Central High School on fire the front doors, and we were walking north down Sheridan Road to go put the fire out, um, and then somebody else put the fire out before we got to Ruth Central High School. When you say School. the front, is that right here on Civic Park? No, sorry, that's my mistake. Um, you're walking north on Sheridan. It's the, it's the side of the building on Sheridan Road towards the left when you're walking north. In the general area where you had helped, tried to help remove graffiti earlier? Yes, on the, in that photo to the right. Okay. And during the evening, was there any friction between your group and protesters slash rioters? Uh, no. Um, the only type of uh, stuff that happened was the person that attacked me first threatened to kill me twice. Okay, and the person who threatened to kill you, we now know, is Mr. Rosenbaum, correct? Yes. Before August 25th of 2020, had you ever seen him before? I did not. Had you ever done anything to upset him? No. Now, you said he threatened to kill you twice. Yes. Describe the first time. The first time was me and Ryan Bolt were a little bit north towards the north corner of 59th and Sheridan and Mr. Rosenbaum was walking with a steel chain and he had a blue mask around his face and um, he was just mad about something me and me and Mr. Balch were asking people if they needed medical help and then he screamed if sorry for my language he screamed if I catch any of you fuckers alone I'm going to fucking kill you and that was directed at you and Mr. Balch? It, it, it was directed at both of us, what I believe. And there was a second occasion where he threatened you? Yes. Um, the second time was outside of the car source. Um, and I, I don't think, I don't know if it was directed it towards me, but I heard it. He said to, I believe it was Joanne Fiedler, Dustin, Colette, and uh, another guy. He's, he was screaming he said I'm going to cut your fucking hearts out and kill I'm not going to repeat the second word but kill you and words now did you ever see Mr. Rosenbaum doing any physical property damage? I did where I saw him with I I now know to be Joshua Zeminski um I saw him tip that trailer over I, and the porta potty. I saw him do both. And I believe he tried to start the porta potty on fire. I don't know. I don't think he I don't think he succeeded. But then I saw him with Mr. Zeminski. He was either helping start or he was like throwing stuff on it. I don't know which one he was doing. Where did you originally see that trailer? That trailer was in the St. James in the St. James Church parking lot, um, sort of like right over here in like 
the backish corner, what it what I remember. And did you see how it got from there to where it was put on fire? It was pulled. By who? Uh, it, it was several people that pulled it into the street, and but I can't tell you definitely who pulled it into the street. And you went down there and saw them starting a fire? I, I didn't go down there. I was at the corner of the car source lot. Okay. And you referred to Mr. Zeminski. Before August 25th of 2020, had you ever met Mr. Zeminski? I have not. Did you ever meet him since? I have not. Now, when you first saw Mr. Rosenbaum, was his top half of his body clothed or unclothed? He was clothed, clothed with a blue mask the first time I saw him. It, uh, yeah, blue mask. And what was on, what color was his shirt, if you remember? Uh, a dark red-ish color. Now, did you provide medical help to anyone? I did. Describe a couple of those occasions. Um... The first time I provided medical help to someone was um, this lady. I, I I think she sprained her ankle or twisted. I, I don't know exactly. I'm not an expert on X-rays, or I wouldn't know. Um, she hurt her ankle and she was being carried by two gentlemen. And I said, "Hey, I, before that I was just, but I was like, hey, do you need help?" And she said yes, and I said, okay, let's go into the car source where I was, and I wrapped her ankle, and then she went on her way, and I said, I told her, I let her know there was a hospital, <coughs> if you, I want to say south down Sheridan, across the street from car source three, the hospital was over there, and she should go get it. Anybody else? Yes. What? Um, somebody threw a chemical bomb, actually right right after I heard I'm going to cut your hearts out for Mr. Rosenbaum. I don't know who threw it, but somebody threw a chemical bomb and Ryan Balch had some effects of it, so I helped Mr. Balch with being able to breathe and I helped flush his eyes out and had him drink some water. Okay. You um in the answer to the question just before you said something about being pepper sprayed? I did. And where did that happen? That happened at the car source, right, I think, I believe it's the first time a big crowd of people were over there. I was pepper sprayed by somebody that was in the crowd. I don't know why, but I was pepper sprayed. Did you do anything in retaliation? I did not. Now, directing your attention to later in the evening, did there, come an occasion where you had contact with Mr. McGinnis? There was. And before this evening, August 25th, 2020, did you ever met or spoke to Mr. McGinnis? I have not. And you and Mr. McGinnis and Mr. Balch go someplace? Yes. And describe that. I get done with my interview with Mr. McGinnis and I ask him I asked Mr. McGinn, no, I don't ask him. I said, if you want to come with us, that's fine, to document and film the me, me and Ryan helping people. And he said, yeah, sure, and he followed behind us. And in that tape for Mr. McGinnis, there's talk about you being an EMT, correct? Yes. Are you an EMT? I am not. You have first aid and other training. As well. I do. And you go to... South on Sheridan Road? Correct. You cross 60th and Sheridan Road? I believe we stay just to the right uh, going south on Sheridan Road. Okay. And eventually you cross Sheridan Road? Eventually. And were the Bearcats there yet? Uh, no. Yes, they were. Okay. Had they set up a line to stop people that you were aware of? Not that I was aware of. Um, I just know they were parked right there and people were throwing rocks at them. Did anybody tell you not to cross that line? You wouldn't be able to go back? Not until later in the evening. Okay. You cross that line, where do you go? 
Uh, we continue straight, uh, straight in a southerly direction down Sheridan Road. Okay. Were you going any place in particular? No, we were just going to see if anybody needed medical help, and I, I looked at a guy's shoulder on the way there. Okay. And you finished with the guy's shoulder, and you continue on, and what happened? I continue walking in a south southerly direction down Sheridan Road, and then, and then as I'm walking, um, I believe you guys have been referring to him as Yellow Pants. Um, he said he he called he said something to me. I believe it was you were the one that pointed your rifle at me with the laser pointed at me. I, I believe that's what I heard. Um, and I I didn't, I that's the first time I saw him that night. So I was confused. So I said, I did. And then I continued to walk away. And was the did an admission that you did it or more of a statement with a question? It was a sarcastic remark. Okay. Did you engage with him any further? No. And. From there, where do you go? Um, there, I continue walking in a southerly direction, merging towards the middle of Sheridan Road. Okay, at that point, do you become aware of anything? In about a couple, as I'm walking, I start to look because I realize Mr. Balch is not with me anymore. Okay, did you continue on your way down Sheridan Road without Mr. Balch? Um, no, I actually went to go look for um, Mr. Balch in the ultimate gas station parking lot. Okay, when you went to the ultimate gas station parking lot, describe what was going on there. There were a lot of people there. Um, I don't really know what was going on. I was just focused on trying to find Mr. Balch. Um, as I was looking for him, couldn't find him. I said, okay, no problem. I'll just go back to the car source lot, car source. Dominic Black. Let me back up. Were you able to get back to car source number two? No, I did not. Describe that. As I was trying to get back, um, the police stopped me. Well, didn't stop me. They told me, I believe they said, lines of to not go down there. And I was telling them, hey, I, I, I need to go down there. That's where I'm at, that business. I don't know exactly how that conversation went, but they wouldn't let me go back to car source lot number two. So you weren't able to car source two? I was not. Did you disobey the police's order? No. And you're alone, you're stuck on the other side of the police line from the car source two, where do you go? I go to where there's other people at the gas station protecting the gas station. And I, I go there because I believe that's the safest place to go because there's other people there and, and at that point were you able to find Mr. Bulch? I was not. Well you're at the ultimate gas station I think we've been calling it? Correct. Um, Point it out just there's no right there the ultimate convenience center diagonal from the um, golf gas station. Okay and when you were there what's the next next significant thing that happened. Dominic Black calls me and he says, Kyle, I need you to get down to the car source lot number three. The cars are being bashed in. They're setting all the cars on fire. I need you to go and put the fires out. Okay. And did you do anything as a result of that phone call? I did. What? At the ultimate gas station, I asked I, I don't know who he is, but I asked an individual if he could come with me and if I could have a fire extinguisher to put out the fires. Were both of those requests satisfied? One of them were. What? I was given a fire extinguisher, but he, he said he can't come with me, um, and he said he believes there's already people down there helping protect the business. Okay. And what did you do then? Um, I, I start running towards the car source lot number three to put out the fires, pausing occasionally to catch my breath and walk. Okay. 
on the way to Car Source 3, did you have any interaction with Mr. Rosenbaum? I did not. Did you speak to Mr. Rosenbaum? No. Did you notice Mr. Rosenbaum doing anything as you went down to Car Source 3? I didn't I didn't notice Mr. Rosenbaum until until he came out from behind the car and ambushed me. Okay, I'll get to that. Did you run the whole way? No, I didn't. Okay. You had your gun, correct? Yes. And you had a fire extinguisher? Yes. And you had your medic? My medical bag, yes. And were you asking people about medic, medic at that point? I was asking people if they needed uh, medical help as I was getting down there. Did you receive any responses? No, I didn't. Describe your approach to car source number three. As I'm walking down Sheridan Road, um, I, I hear somebody scream, burn in hell. And I reply with friendly, friendly, friendly to let them know, hey, I'm just here to help. I'm just, I don't want any problems. I just want to put out the fires if there are any. Um, I continue walking and then I notice the Duramax. I notice a f in the back seat of the Duramax and I step, I step towards the Duramax and um, as I'm stepping forward, I believe his name is now Joshua Zeminski. He steps towards me with a pistol and, and As I'm walking, as I as I'm walking towards to put out the fire, I drop the shirt and I, I take a step back. Okay. When you step back from Mr. Zeminski, what's your plan? My plan is to get out of that and, and go back north down Sheridan Road to where um, the car source lot number two was. And did you get back? Were you able to go in a northerly direction? I, I wasn't. Describe what happens. I, once I take that step back, I look over my shoulder and Mr. Rosenbaum and go back north down Sheridan Road to where um, the car source lot number two was. And did you get back? Were you able to go in a northerly direction? I, I wasn't. Describe what happens. I, once I take that step back, I look over my shoulder and Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Rosenbaum was now running from my right side. Um, and I was cornered from in front of me with Mr. Zeminski and there were <laughs> there were three people right there. That's where I run. <laughs> We're going to just take it. Time for our break anyway. You, you can uh, just relax for a minute, sir. Um, we're going to take a break, uh, about uh, 10 minutes. And please don't talk about the case during the break. Wa read, watch, or listen to any kind of trial.
aim for 10 minutes, but it'll probably be a tad longer.
testifying about coming into contact with Mr. Rosenbaum? Yes. And oh, wait, wait. Oh, I, I apologize. Oh, forgive me. We got everybody? You were testifying about coming into contact with Mr. Rosenbaum? Yes. And you saw Mr. Rosenbaum, what happened? Once I got to that car and I stepped forward to put that fire in the Duramax out and Mr. Zeminski stepped towards me, I went to go run south, back south down Sheridan and Mr. Rosenbaum was right there at the corner of the Duramax starting to chase me and that's when I realized the only place I can run with the people around me is straight towards the building of the car source lot number three. When you saw Mr. Rosemont, that's when you said friendly, friendly? Uh, when I heard burn inside, I don't know exactly where I was at in the time for that. Did Mr. Rosenbaum say anything to you? Um, no, Mr. Zeminski instructed Mr. Rosenbaum to get him and kill him. That's what I heard. And you go running what's been referred to the south west corner of car source? Yes. And as you're running in that direction, describe being chased, what was happening? As I'm running in that southwest direction, Mr. Rosenbaum throws, I, at the time, I, I know it's a bag now, but when he threw it at me um, with the light, it looked silver and it looked like the chain when he threw it at me. I, and then I continue, I, I turn around for, for a, about a second while continuing to run and I point my gun at Mr. Rosenbaum. Does that stop him from chasing you? It does not. They after you turn around and you had your hands up kind of in a low ready position? Yes. And you see Mr. Rosenbaum coming at you? Yes. And what do you do then? Um, after he throws the bag and he continues to run, he's gaining speed on me. A gunshot is fired from behind me, directly behind me. And I take a few steps and that's when I turn around. And as I'm turning around, Mr. Rosenbaum is, I would say, from me to where the judge is uh, coming at me with his arms out in front of him. He, he, I remember his hand on the barrel of my gun. And why didn't you just keep running? When I was over there, there were about a hundred people surrounding that, that those cars and there was no space for me to continue to run to. Okay. And so you turned around? Yes. And as you see him lunging at you, what do you do? I shoot him. And how many times did you shoot? I believe four. And after you shot him, what did you do? Uh, the people around the the people around the cars that were originally there were not there anymore. Um, they they moved away, and I ran around to see if I could help Mr. Rosenbaum. And when you got to Mr. Rosenbaum, what was happening? Mr. McGinnis was, I, he took off his helmet and slammed it on the ground and took off his shirt, and I don't remember what he said. I um, wasn't focused on that. I was in shock, sort of. Let, let me back up a second. Did you know Mr. McGinnis was even around? I didn't. Okay. And he says something to you, and what do you do? Um, I pull out my phone and I call Dominic Black. And you call Dominic, and what do you say? I told him I just shot somebody. I had to shoot him. And what do you do then? Um, I now know it to be Kelly Zeminski, Joshua Zeminski, and I don't know the other people who were screaming, get his ass, get his ass, get him, get him, get him. And. Based upon that, did you feel as though you were safe to stay where you were at? I thought the safest option would, would be to go north down Sheridan to turn myself into the law enforcement down there. And as you head down Sheridan Road, describe what's going on. 
as I'm running, at first I'm in the sidewalk, and Mr. Lakowski, um, Jason Lakowski, is in the sidewalk, and I stop to talk to Mr. Lakowski for a brief second. I remember telling him that I just shot somebody and I need help to get to the police because the crowd, there was a, not a crowd, a mob was chasing me. And did Mr. Lakowski offer you any help? I don't remember. Okay, what do you do then? I, I continue to run after hearing people say, people were saying, cranium him, get him, kill him. It, people were screaming, and I just was trying to get to the police running down Sheridan Road. And you say, I'm trying to get to the police. Why were you trying to get to the police? Because I didn't do anything wrong. I defended myself. Did you feel as though there was safety where the police were? Yes. And as you head down Sheridan Road, what's the next thing you remember? The next thing I remember is Anthony Huber striking me in the head with a skateboard. Okay. As you sit here today, do you remember talking to Gage Grosskreutz? Yeah, eh, sort of, a little bit. I didn't know it was Gage Grosskreutz when he came up to me, but sort of. Okay. And when this individual runs up to you and gets how close? Um, I would say within a foot. Did you shoot him? I did not. Did you point your gun at him? I did not. Why not? I didn't see him as a threat to my safety or life. Okay, was he armed at that time? Not that I noticed. Okay. And you continue running in a northerly direction down Sheridan Road? Correct. And as you're running in that direction, you said the next thing you remember is Anthony Huber? Yes. Describe that. Anthony Huber, what I remember is running past Anthony Huber, and as I'm running past Mr. Huber, he's holding a skateboard like a baseball bat, and he swings it down, and I block it with my arm, trying to prevent it from hitting me, but it still hits me in the neck, and as I block it, it goes flying somewhere off in the distance. And do you stop them? No. What do you do next? I keep running down uh, Sheridan Road towards the police line. Then what happens? Um, I get lightheaded. Um, I almost pass out and I stumble and hit the ground. Okay. Before you hit the ground, how many times were you struck? I believe twice. Okay. Do you remember anything about the other one? I remember the first one being a rock. I don't remember who did it but I remember like the bumpiness of like a concrete rock hitting me in the back of the head. Okay. Now, after being struck with Mr. Huber's skateboard, you end up on the ground. Yes. You're on the ground. What's the first thing you remember? As I'm on the ground, there are people around me. I don't recall how many, but I remember moving my rifle in their direction and they back off besides one person. Okay. When you noticed people by you, you said you moved your rifle in their direction? Yes. Did that individual keep coming? The last person did. Okay. The people that stopped, what did you do to them? Nothing. Okay. And you're saying the last person in that group continued to come at you? Yes. And describe what happened. The last person, um, I, I don't know his name, I don't think he was ever identified, um, jumps at me with his, with, he was wearing boots, I believe, and as he's running at me and jumping, as his boot is making contact with my face, I fired two shots at him. Why did you shoot at him? I thought if he, if, if I were to be knocked out, or he, he would have stopped my face in if I didn't fire. As a result of being kicked in the face, what happens? Mr. Huber, immediately after I'm kicked in the face, runs up as I'm sitting up to try to get up and get to the police. I'm on my back, and Mr. Huber runs up. He, as I'm getting up, he strikes me in the neck with his skateboard a second time. Then what happened? 
he grabs my gun and I can feel it pulling away from me and this I can feel the strap starting to come off my my body and what do you do then I fire one shot and after you fire striking we now know Mr. Huber what do you do I lower my weapon and I see Mr. Grosskreutz with his hands up and as I'm lowering my weapon I look down and then Mr. Grosskreutz he lunges at me with his pistol pointed directly at my head now you heard Mr. Grosskreutz's testimony about re-racking? Yes. Did you re-rack your weapon? I did not. Could I have the exhibit please make sure to see if you would? Showing you what's been previously marked, Exhibit 28, do you recognize this? I do. Now, when somebody would, as Mr. Grosswood said, re-rack, is that this? Yes. Do you call it re-racking? I call it charging, charging, putting a light round into the chamber. And to recharge, you have to pull this all the way back? Yes. Say that's about four inches? I, no, I'm asking you if you agree with that approximation. Mr. Rittenhouse, how far do you think that is? Three, four inches. And if the weapon is loaded and you re-rack, what happens? If there is already a round in the chamber, when you re-rack the rifle, a live round would come out, chambering a new round in, into the chamber. Now, we got to the point where Mr. Grosskowitz is standing in front of you, has his hands up? Correct. And are you aware that he's armed? At that point, I do see a pistol in his hand. Is that the same or different from your first encounter with Mr. Grosskowitz? That is different. And he is standing, you said? How close to you? What I remember is our feet were touching what it seemed like. Okay. And you do what? My rifle is down. His hands are up. His pistol is in his hand. And then Mr. Grosskreutz looks at me. And that's when Mr. Grosskreutz brings his arm down like this. Like he, his arm is like that with me on the ground and his pistol is pointed at me and that's when I shoot him. How many times did you shoot him? Once. And after you shoot Mr. Grosskowitz, do you know where you shot him? No. What happens after you shoot him? Um, he's no longer a threat to me. Um, there's only There's only one person in front of me and his hands are up. I briefly point my rifle at him and I get onto one knee getting up and he backs he backs up with his hands up and I don't shoot him. Did you notice anybody to your sides? To my left there was a gentleman with a pipe and to my right I believe it was a fence post. I, I don't know what it was, but it was it was a large object. Once you're to your feet, what do you do? I start walking towards the police line um, to turn myself into the police. Describe, where is the police line? Is it still in the same place? Uh, it, it moved up a little bit. Um, I, was, I was down in the road about approximately right here. I, I'd say 
over over here somewhere in this area. I don't remember exactly, but the police line was right here. I could I could see the flashing lights as I was trying to get to the police before. Okay. And as you go towards the police line, describe what happens. I run and walk. Um, I put my hands up and um, as I'm walking towards the police, I can't I can't really hear anything. Um, my vision is very narrow. I can only see directly in front of me. I see the flashing lights. Um, I remember I occasionally tried to move my rifle behind me to put it behind me so the so I could so the police didn't see me as a threat when I tried to turn myself in. I continue to walk and then I walk towards the window of the uh, sedan, the police cruiser sedan, I don't know what they're called. Um, and I tell the officer, I just shot somebody, I just shot somebody. And the officer says, get the fuck back or you're gonna get pepper sprayed. Go home, go home, go home. And where do you go after you step back from the police car? I go to car source number two. Okay, and now there wasn't a line there? They weren't stopping people from going in a northerly direction? No, they weren't. And you go to car source, what we refer to as car source number two, and who do you see? I get there and I see... I think the first person I see is Joanne Fiedler. I, I, I don't remember exactly, but I believe that's who's outside at the door. Um, they let me inside. Um, the door was locked, so somebody had to get the key to unlock it. And then we go inside, and I'm, I'm, I'm in shock. I don't really remember what was happening in there. I was, I was freaking out. I, I was just attacked. My head was spinning. Did you go and turn yourself into the Kenosha Police Department? I did not. Why not? Um, there, the Kenosha Police Department was barricaded off with a fence, and they I don't think they were accepting anybody to come to the police department at that time. What did you do then? I went to the nearest police department that I knew of, which was Antioch Police Department in Illinois by my house. Who took you there? My mother. Hey, how did you get to Antioch from downtown Kenosha? Uh, Dominic Black drove me. Hey, and then Dominic... Black drives you where? He drives me to my house in Antioch, Illinois, where I meet with my mother and sisters, and I tell them what happened. I sort of tell them what happened. I was still in shock. Um, my head was still spinning, and then we go to the Antioch Police Department where I turn myself in. Who drove over to the Antioch Police Department? My mother. And did anybody else go there with you? Not, not at first. Okay. And you get to the Antioch Police Department approximately what time? I would say about an hour after the shooting. Okay. And when you get there, are they looking for you? No. Did you have to explain to somebody? I had to tell them that I was just involved in a shooting in Kenosha and I needed Kenosha detectives. Okay. Did they take you into custody immediately? No. What did they do? They had me sit in the lobby of the police department. Were you handcuffed to a chair? I was not. Did you stay there? Uh, for about, f I, I couldn't give you the exact time, but until Detective Howard and Detective Antaranium showed up. Okay. And were you having any physical discomfort as you waited there? I was vomiting and having panic attacks and my head was spinning and I couldn't think clearly at that point. I have nothing for Good morning, Mr. Rittenhouse. Good morning. Everybody that you shot at that night, you intended to kill, correct? I didn't intend to kill them. I intended to, to, I intended to stop the people who were attacking me. 
by killing them. I did what I had to do to stop the person who was attacking me. By killing them. Two of them passed away, but I stopped the threat from attacking me. By using deadly force. I used deadly force. That you knew was going to kill. I didn't know if it was going to kill them, but I, I, used the, I used deadly force to stop the threat that was attacking me. You intentionally used deadly force against Joseph Rosenbaum, correct? Yes. You intentionally used deadly force against the man who came and tried to kick you in the face, yes. correct? You intentionally use deadly force against Anthony Huber, correct? Yes. You intentionally use deadly force against Gage Grosskreutz, correct? Yes. With regard to Joseph Rosenbaum, you fired four shots at him, correct? Yes. You intended to kill him, correct? I didn't intend to kill him. I intended to stop the person who was attacking me and trying to steal my gun. Since August 25th, 2020, this is the first time that you have told your story. It's a stink. Since August 25th, 2020, you've had the benefit of watching countless videos of your actions that night, correct? I've seen certain videos, not all of them. I've seen the majority of them actually here during the trial. You've also had the opportunity to read articles. People have written interviews, things like that, about what happened that night, correct? I, I do my best to avoid what people write on the internet. A majority of it, it's not true. You have also sat here through eight days of trial, correct? Yes. And you've had the opportunity to watch all of the videos yes. that have been played in this trial? Yes. Sir, if you could please let me finish my question before answering and I will do my best to let you finish your answer before I go on to the next question. Fair? Yes. You've also had the opportunity to listen to the testimony of all 30-some witnesses that have testified in this trial so far, correct? Yes. And after all of that now, you are telling us your side of the story, correct? Correct. Um, I'm going to ask you folks to go in the library for just a second. Please don't talk about the case. You need to account for this. Your Honor, I don't want to, I don't want to jury here. He's commenting on my client's right to remain silent. No, Your Honor, I am making the point that after hearing everything in the case, now he's tailoring his story to what has already been introduced. That's the problem is, this is a grave constitutional violation for you to talk about the defendant's silence, and that is, and, and, the, and you're right, you're right on the, you're right on the borderline, and you may, you may be over, but uh, it better stop. Understood. This is, I can't think of the case, the initial case on it, but it's, uh, this is not permitted. All right, um, ask the jury to come in, please.
understand the objection. You were armed with an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle that evening, correct? Yes. You had it loaded with 30 rounds of full metal jacket ammunition, correct? Yes. That weapon with 30 rounds is capable of killing at least 30 people, correct? Yes. You had arranged to have Dominic Black purchase that weapon for you in Ladysmith, Wisconsin in early May of 2020. Is that correct? Um, we were up north shooting and not shooting, we were up north going camping and Dominic Black brought his rifle and he was, we were talking, I was like, hey, what if we get a rifle for me? Um, you, I'll give you the money, you can purchase it, it's yours until I'm 18. So I bought the rifle for Dominic and I can use it, but once I'm 18, um, we can uh, do a private sale and we can have it turned over to my name once I turned 18. Because you knew as a 17 year old, you could not have that gun, correct? I knew I could not buy that gun. You knew you could not possess that gun also, correct? No. You weren't aware that under Wisconsin law? I'm gonna instruct the jury later about the law. So, and that he wouldn't, what he thinks on the subject is not dispositive anyway. So, um, he, it was unlawful for him to purchase the gun. It wasn't just unlawful for you to purchase it, it was unlawful for you to bring it home, correct? In Illinois, I wasn't able to bring it home because I didn't have a FOID card, a firearm owner identification card you in knew Illinois. In, you knew in Illinois that you couldn't get that until you turned 18, correct? No, you can get a FOID card at 16 in Illinois. But you didn't have one? I did not. And even after this gun was purchased for you in May, you never got one after that either, did you? Actually, I applied for a FOID card in May of 2020, but due to the charges and there was a backlog in Illinois because, for the FOID card, but after you filed the charges against me, um, it was denied because of the charges here in this state. You found out about that after you were criminally charged in this case? I found out about this in November of 2020. A letter was sent to my old residence. So you knew that without that FOID card, the gun could not go back to your residence in Illinois, correct? Correct and you agreed that the gun would be kept at Dominic Black's stepfather's house here in Kenosha, correct? Uh, because he had a safe, yes. And you agreed that you wouldn't have access to that gun, correct? Um, we agreed that the only time I would use the gun is when I, would, when I was with him and we would go to like the Bristol shooting range or up north to his land. But the only time prior to the night of August 25th, 2020, that you ever used that gun was up in Ladysmith, correct? Correct. So you didn't go to the Bristol shooting range ever with I did. that gun? I did. Not with that rifle, but I did. Pay attention to my question, please. You didn't ever go to the Bristol shooting range with that gun, correct? Correct. And you picked out that gun <laughs> because Dominic had one, correct? I, yeah. You could have, if you wanted to, chosen from any number of guns that were for sale, fair enough? That were at that store, there weren't many, but yes. I'm sure the store in Ladysmith isn't the only store that sells guns, correct? Uh, you can ask questions. That was don't, a question. Don't, no, it was a statement. I, isn't it correct, Mr. Rittenhouse, that there are other places to purchase guns besides that one store in Ladysmith, Wisconsin? Um, I believe so, but that's where we we're at, so that's where we got the gun. And you, if you wanted to, could have given Dominic Black money to purchase a gun at other locations, fair? Didn't cross my mind, but now that you say it, yeah. Why did you pick or want Dominic Black to buy for you an AR-15 as opposed to a pistol or a shotgun or some other type of rifle? I cannot legally possess or carry a pistol because I'm not 18 in Wisconsin. I, I, I believe it's 18 in Wisconsin for a pistol. Um, but with the, with the rifle, I knew, I knew I could 
possess that rifle. I knew I couldn't buy it, but I knew I could like take it to like the shooting range or possess it. Um, and with shotguns, they didn't have any shotguns in stock. That was my original plan to get a shotgun for trap shooting, but there weren't any at that Lady Smith's, Lady Smith store, and I didn't want to go to Walmart and buy one. So your understanding at that time was that Wisconsin law prohibited you as a 17-year-old from possessing a pistol, but you could have an AR-15? Yes. What was that understanding based on? Uh, the understanding was based on um, when we would go up north, uh, we were, it was me, Dominic, and my sister, and we were allowed to carry the rifles around, and the officers over there said it was fine. Um, I'm going to move to strike as hearsay, what officers what would have told you. You asked the question of what the, way, what the source of his knowledge was. It, it's not admissible, and none of this is, frankly, and uh, that's why I interrupted before. Um, what, the, what the defendant believes the law to be, what the district attorney believe, uh, believes the law to be, what uh, the defense believes the law to be are irrelevant. I will tell you when I instruct you what the law of Wisconsin is pertaining to the possession of a firearm by a person under 18, uh, and that will be the source of your knowledge. I'm allowing the testimony right now because it bears on uh, um, there's an old maxim under the law of ignorantia juris non excusa. Ignorance of the, of the law is not an excuse. Ignorance of the criminal law is not an excuse. If you commit a, wrong, a, a criminal act, whether you knew it was criminal or not, you're responsible for your conduct and, and because you're responsible to know the law. It's not relevant except in this case there are specific issues about his awareness and knowledge about certain conduct that is relevant on some issues. So it's quite complicated. Uh, hopefully it'll sort out when I instruct you at the end. But that's why I'm allowing the questions and the answers. But do not be confused about what anything that these people say is not necessarily accurate as to the state of Wisconsin law. Any question about that? OK, thanks. Go ahead. So you're telling us that the reason that you wanted Dominic to buy you an AR-15 as opposed to a pistol is, is the only reason was because you felt you couldn't lawfully possess a pistol? Correct. You didn't pick out the AR-15 for any other reason? I thought it looked cool, um, but no. You didn't pick it out because you wanted to go hunting with it, did you? No. You didn't pick it out because you were going to um, use it to protect your house? Correct? Correct. You picked it out because it looked cool. I thought it looked cool. Guess it, that's the reason, yes. It resembled the types of weapons that are used in first person shooter video games, correct? I don't really play first person shooter video games. I have, but I believe there's a variety of guns, including shotguns, pistols. It there's guns in video games that resemble all guns. Isn't it true when you would hang out at, with Dominic Black, you'd play Call of Duty and other first-person shooter video games? Sometimes. And those are games in which you use weapons like AR-15s to pretty much shoot anybody who comes at you, correct? It's a video game where two players are playing together. I don't really understand the meaning of your question. To be honest. Isn't one of the things people do in these video games try and kill everyone else with your guns? Yeah, the video game. It's just a video game. It's not real life. Now, you introduced yourself as living in Walworth County right now. Is yes. that right? On the date that this all happened, you were an Illinois resident? Correct. You had grown up in Illinois? Correct. You had not spent any significant time living here in Wisconsin, correct? No. You'd agree with me that's correct? No, I, I spent time at my father's house and partially live here also, so no, that's not correct. You indicated you had attended 
was it Penn Foster High School? Yes. That's an online high school? Correct. So you were not attending high school in person? No. And at the time that all of the things in this case were happening, from the time the AR-15 was purchased to the night of August 25th, you were 17 years old that entire time, correct? Correct. Could we have exhibit number seven up, please? I have put exhibit number seven up on the screen. Do you recognize that? Yes, that's my old TikTok account. That was a TikTok account that you had during the summer of 2020, correct? Yes. And it says your name on there, Kyle? Yes. Your username on TikTok was Four Doors More Whores? Yes. And that's a picture of you there with your AR-15, correct? Yes. And underneath that, you have put on your profile the phrase, bruh, B-R-U-H, I'm just trying, T-R-Y-N-A, be famous. Is that correct? Yes. You're the one who wrote that? Yes. You testified that at some point you were involved in uh, some sort of EMT cadet program. I was a firefighter EMT cadet at Antioch Fire Department. When was that? Um, I was a Antioch, I was a cadet at the Antioch Fire Department, um, I believe from 2018 or 2019 up until the incident of August 25th. An EMT cadet is someone who's just beginning the process of eventually m achieving full EMT certification. Is that correct? No. Were you studying to be an EMT before August 25th, 2020? I was learning about certain things in the field of firefighting and EMS. But that's not actually formal classes, is it? Um, no, we met once a week, and we would either, depending on the day, we would either do um, EMT stuff like learning how to do airways, um, or we'd do firefighter stuff like doing hose drags and learning how to um, crawl through buildings. And these are things that you did with the, um, which firefighter, Antioch Fire Department? Antioch Fire Department. You weren't a member of the fire department, were you? I was. You were a actual on-duty member no. on the roster of the Antioch Fire Department? No, no. Uh, so no. when you say you're a member, what do you mean? I was a member of the Antioch Fire Cadet Program. We were issued shirts, Antioch Fire Cadet member. Um, we would help with the pancake breakfast at the VFWs, and we would wear Antioch Fire Department staff shirts. I still have one in my closet. I, and maybe I didn't express myself clearly. You were not a member of the Antioch Fire Department, correct? I was a member of the cadet program, which was through the fire department. So you'd go out and fight fires? We can go on ride-alongs, but we can't go into burning buildings for liability reasons. You'd go out there and you'd save people from burning buildings? Not me personally. Because as a cadet, they would never let you anywhere near that, right? They wouldn't let any of the cadets go into an actual live fire. At the end of whatever this program is, you weren't actually going to be an official firefighter, were you? No, it's to help prepare you for the firefighter academy, firefighter EMT academy. And you weren't going to be an EMT at the end of this program either, were you? No. You know that to be an EMT, you have to be 18 and a high school graduate, correct? Uh, depending on the state in Illinois, you can take a class at the college at 16 and you can have your EMT license by the age of 17. I wasn't in that class, but in Illinois you can. You never did any of that? 
No, I was online school. The night of August 25th, you're here in Kenosha, Wisconsin, saying you're an EMT, correct? Yes. That was a lie. Yes. You were also telling people you were 18 or 19 years old. That was a lie, too, right? No, I didn't tell anybody my age that night. You never volunteered it at all, did you? I didn't. Because you knew as a 17-year-old you shouldn't have been there, right? No, I just didn't find it relevant to give my name. Well, I gave my name but my age to anybody. It just not, it wasn't something that came up in conversation. It's because you felt if people found out how old you were, they'd realize you shouldn't have been there, right? No, it just because it didn't come up in conversation. If somebody would have asked, I would have been like, yeah, I'm 17. So you felt that as a 17-year-old, it was appropriate for you to be out on the streets of Kenosha with an AR-15 that night. Fair? I believe I had any other right to be there as anybody else. As any other adult? As anybody. But you weren't an adult? No. You indicated that you were working at the RecPlex at, and had been working at the Y before that. Is that right? Yes. That was a YMCA down in Illinois, correct? Correct. And you had gotten furloughed there when COVID hit in March? Yes. And you had only started working at the RecPlex on August 14th, correct? Um, I believe I got hired before that, but I was on vacation on August 14th, so I couldn't, I was on vacation, so I couldn't start until August 14th. Your first time working at the RecPlex was on August 14th, correct? I believe that was my first day. And then you worked the week after that from August 17th to August 23rd, correct? I believe so, uh, to August 24th I worked. And then your final shift was on uh, August 24th, correct? Yes. You worked a total of 41 and a half hours at the RecPlex, correct? That's the number you got. And you were a lifeguard? Yes. You were walking around their swim area with one of those red, long, life-saving things, monitoring the pool, correct? A rescue tube, yes. Okay. So, but that was the, at the indoor pool at the RecPlex? It was at the indoor, it was at the, I don't know if you're familiar with the RecPlex. I am. Um, I guarded the water park area and the competition pool. Okay. So they've got a water park area with a slide and a zero entry pool, is that right? Yes. And then next to that they've got a larger, almost Olympic sized pool where swim meets happen. A 50 meter um, competition pool divided in half to make it a 25. Okay, and you were lifeguarding at both of those? I, I would uh, rotate, we had rotations and me and other guards, we would do three, we had three person shifts. We would rotate out watching the different areas of ourselves. You indicated that at no time did this gun, this AR-15, ever leave the state of Wisconsin. Is that right? Other than the night after, other than that. Before the shootings. Correct. There was a time, though, where you wanted to have it with you down in Illinois, isn't it? It wasn't there? Um, I believe there was a time when I was, me and Dominic were mad at each other. Um, yeah. You were mad at Dominic? Me and Dominic were mad over something. And you wanted to have the gun with you down there? I think I said something along those lines. You'd agree with me that, let me, let me back up for a second here. You have testified to this jury that you used deadly force against Joseph Rosenbaum, Anthony Huber, the man who attempted to kick you in the face, and Gage Grosskreutz on the night of August 25th, correct? Yes. And you did that because you felt that your life was in danger from those four people, correct? Yes. And you are telling this jury that it was, in your mind, justified to use deadly force to protect your own life, correct? Yes. You'd agree with me that you were not allowed to use deadly force to protect that car source building, correct? Well, I, w I wasn't using deadly force to protect the property. I used deadly force to protect myself, so. I, I, please listen to my question and answer my question if you can. You'd agree with me that you were not allowed to use deadly force to protect that car source building, correct? Yes. You'd agree with me that you were not allowed to use deadly force 
to stop someone from smashing the windows of an unoccupied parked car, correct? I don't think you could use deadly force for that. You'd agree with me that you can't use deadly force to stop someone from lighting a metal dumpster on fire, correct? Correct. You'd agree with me that you can't use deadly force to stop someone from tipping over a porta potty, correct? Correct. You'd agree with me that you can't use deadly force to stop someone from lighting a flatbed trailer on fire, correct? Correct. You'd agree with me that you can't use deadly force to stop someone who is about to start an unoccupied car on fire, correct? Correct. You'd agree with me that you can't use deadly force to stop someone from lighting some traffic cones in the middle of the street on fire, correct? Correct. So you understand that there's a difference between using deadly force to protect yourself and using it to protect property, correct? Yes. And you'd agree with me that you're not allowed to use deadly force to protect property, correct? Yes. But yet you have previously indicated that you wished you had your AR-15 to protect someone's property, correct? I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to ask you to go into the library uh, again for a moment, please. Please don't talk about the case. Mr. Richards? Your Honor, Mr. Binger is either forgetting the court's rulings or attempting to provoke a mistrial on this matter. He knows he can't go into this and he's asking the questions. I ask the court to strongly admonish him and the next time it happens, I'll be asking for a mistrial with prejudice. He's an experienced attorney and he knows better. Mr. Binger? First of all, Your Honor, this was the subject of a motion. I'm well aware of that. And the court left the door open. This for me, not for you. My understanding of You your should have come and asked for, uh, for reconsideration. You did on the one motion. And in fact, I granted your motion for reconsideration. That was excuse not me, our motion. I, 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 uh, not to, uh, excuse me. I, uh, I did. I granted. We did not move that for reconsideration. That was their motion. I, I, we have I, not filed any me. motions to reconsider in this case. That was their motion for reconsideration, which I denied. But uh, I said I denied it, or I indicated a bias towards denial is what I did. Held it open with a bias towards denial. Why would you think that that made it okay for you without any advance notice to bring this matter before the jury? You are already, you were, I, I was a, astonished when you began your examination by commenting on the defendant's post-arrest silence. That's basic law. It's been basic law in this country for 40 years, 50 years. I have no idea why you would do something like that. And it gives, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. So I don't know what you're up to. May I respond? Yes. We filed another acts motion on this exact issue because in my mind, and I argued this, it is identical to what was going on on the night of August 25th in the sense that the defendant was using this exact same weapon. He was using it in a manner to try and protect property. No, he wasn't. There's, Your Honor, I, with all due respect. I'm not going to rehash the motion. That's absolutely untrue. It and is there's, no, no, no. Your arguments of record. My comments are of record, and why I ruled as I did is of record. There's nothing that I heard in this trial to suggest that anything's changed. Even if you're correct in your assumption that you know more than uh, I did at the time, uh, you should have come to the court and say, I want to go into this. Uh, why you would think that you could go into it without any advance notice to the court, I don't understand that. And as the uh, defense is pointing out, you're an experienced trial lawyer, and this should not have been gone into. 
Your Honor, there have been things in this case, the testimony in this case, that I believe opens the door to this. For example, the defense has introduced evidence that the defendant pointed a gun at a man wearing yellow pants because that person was on a car, on the car source lot. Now, there's no justification that I can think of why the defendant would point that gun at someone. The defendant has just testified this morning that he agreed with that person in the yellow pants that he pointed the gun at him. He said, I was joking when I said that to the guy in the yellow pants, but he said, he's acknowledged that he told the person in the yellow pants, yeah, you're right, I did point a gun at you when you were sitting on a car. He said, I did. That's what he testified. Exactly. So he's agreeing. May I finish, please? I'd like to have a chance to make a record, if I could, without being interrupted, if that's okay. He has mentioned that he has, he's acknowledged that he's used this gun to protect property. He's also just acknowledged that he knows he can't do that. I am attempting to impeach him now with the prior August 10th incident, 15 days prior, involving the same gun, where he is threatening to use that gun to protect property. It goes... He didn't have the gun with him. Your Honor, he is saying he wished he did so he could shoot people. You know, there's a lot of difference between commenting about something when you haven't got a gun and threatening someone when you do. You know, it's interesting, Your Honor, because the entire defense theory in this case is Joseph Rosenbaum, who was unarmed... I want you to tell me what the defense theory of the case is. I want... Look. May I respond to what you just said, Your Honor? I'd like to respond to what you just said. Can you slow down, please? I apologize, Madam Court Reporter, but I'd like to try and make a record without anyone interrupting me, if that's okay. I believe that there is a central part of this case that Mr. Rosenbaum is making threats that he has no ability to carry out. So, to your point, Your Honor, you're arguing that this August 10th incident, one aspect of why you don't believe it's relevant is the defendant didn't have the gun with him. This case is about someone who didn't have a weapon, and yet the jury is being told because of those threats, that means the defendant has to defend himself. So, with all due respect, Your Honor, mere verbal threats have already been shown to this jury and used as a basis for someone's subsequent actions. I am attempting, with the defendant, to use his mere verbal threat on August 10th, 15 days prior, that he's going to shoot shoplifters with his AR-15 to impeach the defendant in a murder trial. I would ask the court's forbearance to do that. I apologize, Your Honor. You're right. I probably should have brought this to your attention earlier. I may have misunderstood your ruling because I thought your ruling was if the evidence in this case made that more relevant, you would admit it or at least consider it an admittance. I believe, based on the evidence that we've heard and more specifically exactly what the defendant said earlier about admitting pointing a gun at someone who was merely jumping or sitting on a car, that the door is open now to this testimony. And I continue to believe that his state of mind, his intent, his belief as to self-defense is the core of this case. That was the basis for my motion. You were strongly inclined against it. I understand that. But now we're in the middle of trial, and there's been a lot of evidence that's come in that I think makes this relevant. So I'm attempting to impeach the defendant on his beliefs. I believe I'm entitled to impeach the defendant on his beliefs and on his statements. I'm going to interrupt you now because you're talking about his beliefs. I think that's what they call his statements to you. Because he just said, can't use deadly force, can't threaten to use deadly force to protect property. So now I'm impeaching him on that. Your Honor, the court has seen no reason to change its ruling. And just so this record is clear, in spite of the lengthy statement by Mr. Binger, before we started today, the court specifically stated in Mr. Binger's presence, there's been nothing to have me change any of my rulings. There have been numerous occasions during this trial where they've opened the door. The one time when they're going into Mr. Rosenbaum's prior reason he doesn't like guns, and I said something, I whispered in Mr. Krause's ear, it's because of the prior convictions. Please stop. And he did. He knows if you're going to go into something that's been excluded in a pretrial order, you better ask the court, you better get permission. This is ridiculous. It wasn't excluded, Your Honor. You know why it was excluded in the first place? Because it was propensity evidence. That is exactly what 90404 is designed to prevent. You're talking about his attitudes. 
his attitude is he wants to shoot people. Now, I've admitted that kind of evidence in other trials when it's been appropriate. I didn't admit it in this case because to me, what I've heard in this trial, and by the way, Mr. Richards absolutely correctly points out that just hours ago, I said I had heard nothing in this trial to change any of my rulings. That was before so the why? Testimony, Your Honor. Pardon me? That was before the defense testimony. Don't get brazen with me. Uh, uh, you knew very well. You know very well that an attorney can't go into these types of areas when the judge has already ruled without asking outside the presence of the jury to do so. So don't give me that. That's number one. Number two, this is propensity evidence. I said at the time that I made my ruling, and I'll repeat again now for you, I see no similarity between talking about wishing you had your AR gun, which you don't have, so that you could take fire rounds at these uh, thought to be shoplifters, and the incidents in these cases, which are not, there's nothing in your case that suggests the defendant was lying in wait to shoot at somebody or reflecting upon the shooting for a vast amount of time. Every one of the incidents involves uh, matters that involve seconds in time. So I don't, I commented at the time, I don't see the similarity, and I don't see the similarity now. If it's not similar, that's, that's the whole rule. Those are all the exceptions to 90404. Check the authorities. Wigmore and Evidence, Judge Weinstein, Colonel McCormick. It's the, crime, the prior act has to bear the signature of the accused, or it has to be so similar as to suggest it's a common plan or something like that. You have an incident where he's making comments about some alleged shoplifters versus and uh, 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 crimes that involve instantaneous actions, whether premeditated murder or whether self-defense, that's for the jury to decide. But I don't see the similarity. I said it couldn't come in, and it isn't coming in, no matter what you think. Number two, I, I, I have to be concerned that with what Mr. Richards has said about the, the, the progress of the trial, and, and um, when, when you were way, well, I said you were over the line, in, uh, close to, or over the line on commenting on the defendant's pretrial silence, which is a well-known rule. I, 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 I'm astonished that that would have been an issue. So I don't want to have another issue as long as this case continues. Is that clear? It is. Thank you. May I ask the jury to come back in, please? All right, folks, the objection has been sustained. <clears throat> Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Thank you, Judge. So I want to turn your attention to the day of August 25th, 2020. Okay. You had spent the night at Dominic Black's house, is that right? Yes. And you indicated that you had worked at the RecPlex the night before, is that right? The 24th, correct. Okay. And you worked until about 7 p.m.? I, I couldn't give you an exact time, but I'd say I got off around between 6 and 7. I, I don't recall. It's been 
while. And then you drove your car over to Dominic's house? Yes. Okay, so um, the rest of the time it seems like you're being driven around in Mr. Black's car. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Why did you guys use his instead of yours, if you know? Um, at the time I didn't have a driver's license and I would drive just to get to work and sometimes to go to Dominic's dad's house. So even though you didn't have a driver's license, you drove from your home in Antioch to the Recplex to work that day? Um, yes, to be able to get to work. And then after work, uh, you drove without a driver's license to Dominic Black's house? Yes. So I assume then on the week prior to that when you'd drive yourself to work, that was also without a driver's Don't license? Have objection to this. It's put I'll, I'll move on. So you drove to Mr. Black's house, you left your car there? Yes. And you spent the night at his house? Yes. And then the next day you guys woke up at some point and came down to Ruther, is that right? Spent the night at his house and uh, had dinner, woke up in the morning, um, had breakfast, we were going through social, we were, we were, I was on social media and we saw all the damage and we saw the car store, so we decided to go downtown. And you came down in uh, Dominic's car? Correct. And you said that uh, there was a time in which you were cleaning graffiti at Ruther? Yes. And then at some point, I believe you said, and I want to make sure I'm understanding the timeline here, that you went to one of the car sources and, and encountered the owners, Sam or Sal or whoever they are, correct? Yes. Which of the car source locations was that? It was the car source right here. And that's the one at the northeast corner of 59th and Sheridan? Correct. And that's the one that had gotten totally burned out on one of the previous nights? Yes, that was the one where everything was destroyed. The other car sources still had cars there. So. Now before that, had you ever worked at car source before? I have not. Had you ever bought a car there before? I have not. Had you ever even heard of car source before all that? Yes. Through Dominic? Well, no. Um, I, I would drive past it on a daily basis. I was in Kenosha almost every day and I'd drive down Sheridan Road almost every day. Okay. So you saw the business along with the churches and the ultimate gas station and the courthouse and everything else in that area? Yes. Okay. And you talked to these owners yourself? Me and Dominic did. Okay. And did they ask you to come protect the property? They didn't ask me. Directly? They, they didn't ask me directly, they asked Nick Smith. Okay. And was Nick Smith around for that at that moment? He wasn't there when me and Dominic were talking to them. Did you ever personally witness any of these car source folks, Sal or Sam or any of the folks that were running that business, did you ever personally ask, witness them ask Nick Smith to guard any of their properties? No. Did you ever witness any of them ask anyone? to guard any of their properties? Not that I can recall. What time, if you recall, did uh, you find out that they'd asked Nick Smith? I believe I said in my direct examination between 3.15 and 3.30. And that was shortly after you had sent a text to um, Sam, right? Co correct. And you texted him and asked him uh, if you could protect his business that night, correct? I did. And in that text you said, I'm more than willing and will be armed, correct? Yes. You meant you'd be armed with your AR-15? Yes. And you said that me and my brother would both be there armed, correct? Yes. By your brother you meant Dominic? Yes. He's obviously not legally your brother. No. And you said in the text, I just need address. Do you recall that? Yes. Why did you need the address of a location you'd already been to? Um, I just wanted to like pinpoint it and on the Google Maps because uh, GPS, because you know with all the, all the roads were closed down in Kenosha, I just wanted to know the best route to drive there with Dominic. But you just told us that you drove past here every day up and down Sheridan. Why did you need GPS to help you find a place that you drive past every day? The roads weren't closed when I drove past them every day. But you still knew where you were going, right? Sort of, but with like the back roads. I... 
Okay, so let's talk about the roads being closed. What do you mean by that? Well, Sheridan Road was closed off, and I I'm trying to remember. I don't think there, there are a lot of roads closed off. I couldn't tell you exactly their names right now. Was that because there was construction going on? Uh, no, they were closed off because of the riots. They were closed off to keep people out of the area, right? Yes. And you knew there was a curfew that night, right? Um, I, I believe I got, I got an emergency alert text at around 8 p.m. Just like everybody else saying, stay no, off the no streets. I'm sorry. Objection. Back. There's no curfew charge. It's still relevant to his decision making. Just like everybody else, you got a message saying, get off the streets at 8 o'clock that night, right? Yes. And despite that message, you came down, correct? I was already in Kenosha downtown when I got that message. Once he got that message, you didn't decide, I'm going to leave and go home like I'm supposed to, correct? I stayed at the car source. And you knew that there was this curfew in place that meant you shouldn't be there anymore, correct? There are, I, I'd say, hundreds, if not thousands of other people there that night that also got the same message. So if they're all breaking the law, you can too? I was, I don't think the curfew was really being enforced. So if a law is not being enforced, you can disregard it? You said that there was a time in which Nick Smith asked you guys to drive him down to Chicago? Correct. To buy a piece of body armor? Correct. Down by O'Hare? Correct. And you guys were willing to do that um, at first? D Dominic was willing to do it. It was more of Dominic's thing because Nick Smith was going to give Do throw in like 20 bucks to Dominic when he bought it for like gas. So Nick Smith was going to pay $20 for the gas to drive down to O'Hare where Nick Smith was planning on buying this body armor. Yes. And he needed that body, or he, the, the idea was the body armor would be used that night, correct? I believe so. That's why there was some urgency about going down right away, right? Yeah. This was part of the plan to come down, down to downtown that night, right? He wanted to go to O'Hare to buy the body armor, so yes. Do you understand my question? Can you rephrase sure. it? Yeah. Absolutely. Like, the, the urgency to get that body armor that day was because he needed it for that night, right? I wouldn't say he needed it, but he wanted it. And instead of making the drive, you gave that body, your own body armor to Nicholas Smith. Correct. You had it along with you? Yes. You brought it along with you that day because you thought you might need it yourself that night, correct? No, I kept it in my trunk of the car. I always had it. You drive around with body armor in the trunk of your car regularly? Well, it was just in the back of my trunk. I never really took it out. And you said at some point that day you went to Jelinski's. That's the hunting goods, fishing store out on Highway 31 and 52nd Street to buy a couple of slings, is that right? That's correct. And this was one sling for you and one for Dominic, right? Yes. And you bought two of the identical type of sling, correct? Yes, the cheapest, the cheapest ones they had. And that's a single point sling, meaning it attaches to the gun in one location, correct? Yes. And then it wraps around your body, correct? Yes. And it's designed to help you retain possession of that weapon, correct? You probably know more about them than I do. I just got it to hold the rifle. So when I'm doing medical aid, I don't have to sit on the ground and have to worry about it being stolen. Because you realize that you couldn't have that gun on you while you're doing any sort of medical aid, correct? I realize, I knew that I couldn't, without a sling, have it on me. That's why I got the sling, so I could have my hands free. But even when you had the sling, there was a time in which you took off your entire gun apparatus and handed it to Joanne Fiedler because it was in the way of you trying to treat someone, right? At that instance, yes, because it was hitting the ground. 
uh, the rifle was hitting the ground. Um, when I bought it, that was the purpose of it. I don't think it really worked, now that this, I think of it. This big, long AR-15 really got in the way whenever you tried to help someone, right? Sometimes. If you had a handgun, for example, you could have been, it would have been physically more easy for you to try and treat someone. Fair? If I could have legally carried a handgun, I would have carried a handgun instead of a pistol. I mean, instead of a rifle. You grabbed some medical supplies from Dominic Black's house before you came downtown that night, correct? I grabbed extra gauze, but that's about it. You testified earlier that your AR-15 was loaded with 30 rounds of ammunition. Is that right? Yes. Where did that ammunition come from? That was from our last, um, last trip up north, from May, the time we took it up north. So when the gun was left at Dominic's Black's house, it had that ammunition with it? Um, it yeah, the ammo was in a box, I don't, in a magazine, I don't really know. When you were at Dominic Black's house on August 25th, you found your, that AR-15 downstairs in his basement, correct? No. Where did you find it at? It was downstairs in the basement, but it was, I was told by Dominic Black, hey, go downstairs, grab, that rifle, grab your rifle. So you knew up until that point that that rifle was being stored in a gun safe in the garage, correct? Correct. And you didn't have the code or any access to that gun safe, correct? I did not. It just happened that on this particular day, Dominic Black's stepfather had moved that gun into the house, correct? Yes. You didn't know that beforehand? I didn't. You didn't know that it had been taken out of the safe? No. And so you went downstairs and grabbed it? After instructed to do so by Dominic, I did. And it had that magazine? After I was instructed to do so. After I was instructed to do so by Dominic, I did go downstairs and grab it. And it had the magazine already inserted in the rifle? It did. And the magazine was already loaded with 30 rounds? I believe so. When did you chamber a round? Um, I don't know if I ever did. Well, you had to have to fire the gun, right? Yeah, I think you... I think it was already chambered when I got it. I, that's what I remember. I don't remember racking it at all that night. Because the way this type of gun works is that you have to have a magazine with ammo in it. You have to insert the magazine into the gun, and then you have to rack it to load one of those rounds into the chamber, correct? Yes. And you were familiar with how to do all that, correct? Yes. And it can't discharge a bullet unless a bullet is racked into the chamber, correct? Correct. And so your testimony here, as best you can recall, is that you never had to do the initial racking because the bullet was already in the chamber when you took possession of it that day. Is yes, that fair to I, say? I, I, believe so. I believe that it was already racked. And the ammunition that was in that was full metal jacket ammunition, correct? 223 uh, full metal jacket. 223 being the caliber. Yes. And full metal jacket being the type of casing, correct? Yes. Uh, full metal jacket is the bullet type. The bullet type. Okay, I apologize. And you're aware there are different types of bullets, like hollow point bullets, correct? Yes. Um, yes. And when you were in the process of purchasing this gun, well, let me back up for a second. You said that the 30 rounds of ammo were left over from... Previous. I assume you mean when you were up in Ladysmith? Yes. And you were practicing with the gun up there? Yes. And they, uh, Dominic Black's family has some sort of firing range or shooting range up there, is that right? They have a gravel pit where um, it's safe to shoot. And you and Dominic would practice with your AR-15s shooting at targets in that gravel pit, correct? Correct. And you would shoot at targets as far as, what, 75 yards away? No. How close were the targets? I was about, I was about, I think the furthest I ever got was maybe from me to the TV. 
You didn't shoot at any targets farther away than that? No. Dominic Black testified that he shot at targets 75 yards away. Did you see him do that? I didn't, but I don't know what Dominic Black saw or what Dominic Black was shooting at. I, I wasn't with him when he did that. But you were aware of the fact that the AR-15 was capable of hitting targets much further away than you the TV, correct? I believe so. Did you know the capabilities of your own weapon? I knew that it, it could shoot and I believe from a distance. I don't know how far. I'm not an expert on AR-15s. Did you personally purchase that 223 full metal jacket ammunition? I did not. Who did? Dominic did. Did you ask him to purchase it? I did not. So you didn't know what type of ammo was in that gun. Is that I, right? I knew they were 223 full metal jackets. I, the first time I shot it, I had to load it into the magazine. So you knew the type of round, but you didn't know what those rounds were capable of doing. Is that fair to say? Believe a bullet's a bullet. As you sit here today, you know that there are different types of bullets, right? Yes. You know that hollow point bullets, for example, do different things to a animal or a human than full metal jacket bullets, correct? Yeah. Full metal jacket is a like a defense round, like another type of defense round. I know full, people use full metal jacket for hunting, and hollow point is something that causes more damage. Hollow point bullets are designed to hit the animal that they're being shot at. Let's say a deer, for example, and explode inside that body. Correct? No, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah, when you say explode, are you saying expand or explode? Because there are such things as exploding bullets. Sure. Let me let me rephrase, Mr. Rittenhouse. What is your understanding of what a hollow point bullet would do if it were shot at, say, a deer? I, I don't think people use hollow point. That wasn't my question, sir. What is your understanding of what that bullet would do? Let me let me rephrase it then, because you're aware that people use hollow point bullets in their pistols to defend themselves against other people, correct? Yes. Ryan Balch, for example, testified in this trial that he was carrying a pistol loaded with hollow point ammunition for self-defense. Do you remember that testimony? I, I do. So what is your understanding, if you have one, as to what hollow point ammunition would do to a human? I believe it would do the same thing as any other bullet. Um, like I said, a bullet's a bullet. Um, I just believe hollow points, I, I'm sorry, I don't know much about ammo. Um, I'm trying to think of what I remember, but I just don't know much about ammo. So you didn't know the difference between what a full metal jacket bullet would do versus a hollow point, right? I, I believe a hollow point, From I, I just don't know much about this. Um, I believe a hollow point would cause more damage. To the first target but it wouldn't continue through to any other targets, right? I, I, I don't know the answer Whereas to that. Whereas a full metal jacket bullet is specifically designed to continue through its first target this and keep flying, correct? I, I, I you know, uh, there, there, uh, uh, <clears throat> first of all, the, 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 the um, hollow point is not guaranteed to stay in the first object struck, which is, so what you said was not correct. Uh, uh, secondly, there's no testimony on that, Your Honor. Uh, no, but you've been testifying, and that's what Mr., that's what, Mr., we're going to break a break for lunch. Uh, please don't uh, talk about the case. Uh, read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. We'll see you, uh, let's hope, at uh, about 1245. Oh, I've got a couple of hearings at 1245. Uh, let's say 1 o'clock. I apologize for taking time away from you.
Okay, thank you.
We are uh, back uh, in the appearances are as before with the jury absent. And anything before we start? There is, Judge. What's up? Hi. Um, Judge, I'm uh, at, the, at the lunch break. Um, I had done some research. And at this point, um, the defense is going to be making a motion for a mistrial. However, that motion is going to be requested with prejudice. Um, I'm, I'm aware that the court's aware that normally a, a defense motion uh, for a mistrial does not uh, preclude a retrial. I understand that. There are exceptions to that, however. And um, the case that I uh, am drawing this from is Day versus State. It's 76 with second 588. And what it says is, an exception to this rule exists where a defendant's motion is necessitated by prosecutorial impropriety designed to avoid an acquittal. Now, what has happened in, uh, in this, this morning was uh, two times. Uh, the state had commented on Mr. Rittenhouse's right to remain silent. The first time he was admonished by the court, the second time the court had the jury leave and re-admonished him on that. Prior to Mr. Rittenhouse testifying, this court addressed various things with not only Mr. Rittenhouse, but with the lawyers. You had cited various statutes, and then you had asked if there anything had, would be coming up on, for example, I think 90608. One of the other things you addressed was 90404. And you had said that based on the information that had come out at the trial, nothing had changed as it relates to your ruling. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Binger stated, and we looked it up, previously, he said to Mr. Rittenhouse, previously indicated that you wish to have your AR-15 to protect someone's property. Clearly in violation not only of the prior ruling that you had made, but the ruling that very day, that very morning. Um, it appears to be uh, that there are two really elements the court must consider when making a determination on a mistrial for what amounts to prosecutorial overreaching. And the first one is the prosecutor's actions must be intentional in the sense of a culpable state of mind in the nature of awareness that his activity would be prejudicial to the defendant. I would argue to you that that's clearly aware of that. You had warned him, uh, you had told him prior to uh, Mr. Rittenhouse testifying that these things, certainly the 90404 was off limits. You had warned him about the uh, infringement on his constitutional right to remain silent. He did it again. The second one, I think, requires some action by the court in terms of a finding. The second one says the prosecutor's actions was designed uh, to uh, allow uh, another chance to convict. That is, to provoke a mistrial in order to get another kick at the cat because the first trial is going badly or to, pre or to prejudice the defendant's rights to successfully complete the criminal confrontation at the first trial. Now, the, the case that I had cited is a Kenosha case. Um, State versus Coping? Coping? Yep. Uh, 100 with second, 700. C-O-P-E-N-I-N-G? Yes, sir. In that case, the court didn't make findings uh, regarding the prosecutor's actions. So I don't know that it's my role to sit here and say, who's winning? I, I don't think that's necessarily what I'm supposed to do. But I think the court has to make some findings as it relates to the bad faith on the part of the prosecution. And if the court makes a finding that uh, the actions that I had talked about were done in bad faith, then I think both elements uh, for mistrial with prejudice have been met. And I think under the circumstances, based on what I've put forth on the record, I would certainly ask the court to consider those. Um, and I would ask the court grant the motion uh, with prejudice. Thank you. Thank you. State? Your Honor, I would like an opportunity to more fully respond to this um, in, uh, with a little bit of research. Um, 
At first blush, though, uh, and I, I reserve the right to present case law and additional um, uh, sites to the court, but I do want to point out for the record that the defendant has uh, presented interviews to uh, at least one media source and at least one online source uh, since his arrest. Um, and there have been questions about uh, that night. There have been questions about what he did, uh, things like that. Um, he has uh, decided, probably on, on advice of counsel in those certain circumstances, not to uh, give a statement in the media uh, about what happened. But he is talking about his family life. He's talking about his friends. He's talking about the, the circumstances of the case. He's talking about how this has affected him and things like that. Um, so. My point in asking those questions was, you have agreed to talk to the media. You've agreed to talk about yourself. You've agreed to get interviews. Um, but until now, this is the first time you're explaining your actions. And so I'm not, I wasn't referring to his in-custody statements. In fact, I never asked either detective about what the defendant told them. He actually starts to tell them some things, and then he says he wants a lawyer, and they stop him. And they Mirandize him first, by the way. Uh, then he starts to tell them some things, and he says, but I want to talk to my lawyer. And they're like, okay, we're done. So I'm not referring to that. I didn't ask any questions of the detectives about that. Um, but since this, the defendant has spoken to the media. He has talked about his life, about circumstances related to this case. He just hasn't given his exact version of events that night. So his voluntary discussion to speak to the media uh, has nothing to do with the Fifth Amendment. That is his own decision. And if he's going to pick and choose what he wants to talk about in those uh, voluntary interviews with the media, then I think that's fair game. It doesn't implicate his Miranda rights. It doesn't implicate the Fifth Amendment. He's making his own voluntary choice. Well, wait a minute. You don't think he could give an interview about his, his uh, awards he won in high school or his demerits that he got or his, uh, and, 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 and about his sports activities and his swimming and, and that? And, uh, and declined to answer any questions about the incident in question, and that somehow a waiver of his right to silence? I, I think he's doing more than that, Your Honor, uh, in these interviews. Um, he I don't know. I, I knew nothing about them. I never, I, you know, I, I haven't seen all, all of, I haven't seen probably 1% of all the evidence, which is pretty typical, as you know. So I have no way of knowing it. And, you have some interview, uh, some interviews that he gave to a uh, media or to whatever. Yeah, there's an interview that we're looking at on our computer right now from um, the Washington Post, uh, where he talks to them. Um, I know there's one. Uh, I think it's either the New Yorker or the GQ magazine, uh, where he s speaks to the reporters also. Um, and he doesn't go into specific details about what happened that night, but it's not like it's talking about school or swimming or things well, like that. Well, no, 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 no. Don't, don't leave it at, he doesn't go into specific details. I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly, there could be a waiver, but a very modest discussion about the activities of that night. And if you're suggesting that occurred, that could make a big difference. Um, but um, even, even a small discussion on his part of the uh, night in question might be a full waiver. I don't know, but I and I won't know until I see it. But uh, why don't you uh, make copies of it and? Uh, Can we have a few minutes to? to well, we won't do it right now. I, I I do agree with you that this is not something that I would want to do. Um, sitting here uh, without giving you an opportunity to respond, um, although I would be interested in your preliminary response to uh, the. the excluded evidence that you uh, touched on after having been told not to do it or having been told that I was confirming my prior rulings. I do want to just point out right now we've got it on the screen. This is a Washington Post article uh, and there's a reference to an interview that he says, the defendant says, he did not regret having his gun because, quote, I would have died that night if I didn't, end quote. So that's a direct quote from the defendant to the media about that night. What about that? Your Honor, all I can say about that interview is there were prior counsel representing him. Um, I don't care about that. Well, and, and I believe it was a telephone interview. I, I don't know anything about the circumstances of that. I'd have to read the article. 
Well, that might make a difference. <laughs> Um, and what, you know, what about the, um, uh, you're uh, asking questions about excluded evidence? Your Honor, the, we, went, we went over this earlier, and I, I don't want to repeat myself because I know you've heard me, but if I could just summarize it. Uh, I did hear you talk about that evidence this morning before testimony. The defendant then took the stand. He admitted that he had said to the person in the yellow pants, that he had pointed the gun at that person. I have seen that video. Um, it was actually introduced by the defense. I think it was even in their opening statement. And there is this person who confronts the defendant and accuses him of this. Frankly, to be honest, Your Honor, when I watched the video the first time, I didn't hear the defendant's reaction. I thought it was someone making an accusation, and then the defendant walking away as if trying to avoid a confrontation. I was surprised to hear the defendant admit in his testimony, on direct, by his attorney, that yes, I did tell that person that I had pointed the gun at them. He explained then that he was joking when he said that. The jury can evaluate that. It goes to his credibility, it goes to whether or not he's telling the truth, it goes to his decision making. That is, again, this is an incident that occurred that night, so it's not something that happened separate in time. It presumably happened a few minutes before. Um, but I, like I said, I was taken aback by the defendant admitting that he had said to this person, yes, I pointed a gun at you. Um, and I think it's fair to say that watching that video, that that person, you know, believes strongly that this happened, the defendant is telling him it happened. Now the defendant today is giving us a different version and saying, oh, I made it, I was joking, I was just kidding that guy or whatever. I'd like to probe that. I'd like to probe what he said to that person. I'd like to probe what his motivations were, etc. I'd like to probe whether, in fact, he really did do that. Um, and I think that that changes the equation with regard to the CVS video that was the subject of the other acts motion. Because in my mind, it is very similar. And I know we've disagreed on that, and I'm not going to belabor the point, Your Honor, but that was where I was coming from, was there's been a change in the testimony of the defendant today that I think makes that evidence. It's admissible and much more relevant than it already was, and I thought it was already uh, relevant. And the court is, I, I do want to be clear so also. So I'm just here on the sidelines just to. Well, you, yeah, I, I had made a ruling that the ev evidence wasn't coming in, and you decided that it was. I, I, if I could just respond to that briefly, Your Honor, I was about to say, I did not interpret your ruling as an absolute. We, we've had three state motions in the room. <coughs> there was one in which we asked the court to introduce evidence that the defendant was at Pudgy's Bar with Proud Boys, and you were clear that is not coming in. There was, you know, don't get into other subjects. Get it? Get, come on, what you're telling me. You're an experienced trial attorney, and you're telling me that when the judge says, I'm excluding this, you just to take it upon yourself to put it in because you think that you've found a way around it? Come on. If I may finish, Your Honor, I was about to say, I, your, your ruling on our three motions and uh, other acts motions was there were some gradations there. That you were clear that some things were absolutely out, and then you left the door open on other things. I, I, no. So I, I, I saw that distinction, and I thought to myself, Clearly, I know this is out, but you left the door open on other things. So I didn't interpret your ruling as this is absolutely never coming in. And I have practiced before you, Your Honor. I have filed other acts motions before you. Your practice oftentimes is to reserve ruling on those until you see the evidence. And I think you even said something to that effect at our motion. I undoubtedly did. So I thought this is my good faith explanation to you. And if you want to yell at me, you can. My good faith feeling this morning after watching that testimony was you had left the door open a little bit, now we had something new, and I was going to probe it. I don't believe you. There better not be another incident. I'll take the motion under advisement. Um, and you can respond. Um, when you say that, that you were acting in faith, good faith, I don't believe that, okay? Let's proceed. Everybody in good faith. All right. Um, bring, would you come up, please, Mr. Rittenhouse? I do have. Yeah. Your Honor. Yeah. 
I do have another um, item that I want to raise before the jury comes in and raise it with you. Um, there was an other acts motion with regard to the defendant being at Pudgy's Bar after a court appearance in January in which he poses for selfies wearing a shirt that says free as fuck. I would like to ask the defendant if he posed for selfies after a court appearance with members of the public wearing that shirt. I do not intend to talk about who those people were, what groups they were affiliated with, or anything along those lines, but I believe that it is relevant when the defendant goes to a bar after a court appearance and poses for selfies wearing a shirt like that. I think it is relevant to some of the issues that have come up in this case. For example, his remorse or lack of remorse, his uh, utter disregard for human life, uh, those are things that I think it comes into play because I think that behavior is not consistent with someone who has a regard for human life. The jury has already watched him break down on the stand with emotion. I'd like to probe how heartfelt and sincere these emotions are when you go to a bar and you post for selfies with people. When you're out on bond in a first degree intentional homicide trial wearing a free as fuck shirt. So, as I said, I want to use the photograph. I'm not going to talk about any of the people or who they were from. In fact, the photograph I'm going to use has actually got their faces blocked out. So we won't see any of the people in the crowd. We'll just see the defendant standing with a group of people for a selfie with that shirt on. That's as far as I want to go. Daniel, this issue. Nobody got an opportunity. First of all, you've made a ruling on it, and it was clear prior to him testifying. So part of this is, would we have raised it? Would we have brought it up if we, if we would have known that it was going to be coming in? We have done not, there's been nothing to open this door, Judge. Nothing that has been said to open the door about what happened four months after this is relevant in any way to what happened that evening. That is part of what the court had ruled. You had said four months after, I don't see how that goes to any 90404 type of uh, admissible evidence. So. My argument is, A, you ruled on it previous to him testifying. You confirmed your ruling, which you had made previously, where Mr. Binger just said you had shut the door on it. So apparently, he doesn't believe a door that is shut should stay shut. However, now he's asking that something be admitted that, to be fair, this should have been brought up sooner. This jury, I, I would have, I did the void deer, I would have void deered on an issue of whether or not they heard it, saw it, were aware of it, how they felt about it, whether it uh, had an impact on their ability to be fair in the case. We never went there because of your prior ruling. So there's nothing that's opened this door, and I don't think it's relevant something that happened four months late. He talked about uh, indifference to human life. That's that night, not four months later. There's nothing, nothing that's relevant about that. You've already made your ruling. I ask that you stick with it. Uh, I'm struggling with why it would be relevant to any of the issues in this case. Um, you know, if, it, if you, he were on trial for using exquisitely bad judgment, if he were on trial for behaving in a very offensive way, uh, then I could see the purpose. But an incident that occurred four months after the incidents in question, I don't see how that jury can work with that in reaching any conclusions about the issues in this case. First of all, Your Honor, we have introduced evidence that the defendant had a, a slogan on his TikTok page, bro, I'm just trying to be famous. This case has made him famous, and he's posing for selfies as a result. One of our theories of this case is that his behavior that night was intended to gain attention, to be famous, and he's reaped the benefits of that. Second of all, he is on trial, in, in my opinion, for exquisitely poor decision making. Taking a gun that he's not legally entitled to have, coming down in violation of the curfew, running around the community with that gun, trying to be a police officer when he's not, uh, confronting protesters that he knows are hostile, and uh, all of those behaviors, I think, are exquisitely bad judgment. So the jury can make that decision. The jury can give 
what weight they want to this evidence, but it's, the, it's moments after he has a court appearance here. He's on, out on bond on, in this case when he decides to do this behavior, and nobody made him do it. Nobody forced him to go to the bar, nobody forced him to wear the shirt, nobody forced him to pose for selfies. It's his own decision making. And when I, I you know, when I tried when I when I made reference to exquisitely poor judgment, I was talking about at the incident when he was wearing the shirt. Because uh, you look, uh, everybody uh, in, in all of humanity, at one time or another, displays bad judgment, sometimes exquisitely bad judgment. And we don't let it into people's trials on unrelated matters. So I, I wasn't referring to his having had bad, good or bad judgment on the day in question. Uh, that's a legitimate inquiry. And you're being allowed to present a lot of evidence on that subject. And the jury is going to be instructed on in some of the, uh, the element of some of the crimes that are charged here is going to uh, deal with the, ca the caliber of his judgment. But you're talking about an incident that occurred four months later. So I'm not seeing it, and I don't want to waste any more time with it. Uh, I, I, um, I don't think that it, I've ruled before. It's not admissible, and I have heard nothing to change my mind about that. It was sought to be admitted earlier for a different I, purpose, Ron. I'm sorry. It, it was sought to be admitted earlier for a different purpose than it is today. I, the court has ruled that it can't be admitted for the prior purpose, but I am seeking to introduce it for a different purpose today. And that request is denied. Thank you. Okay. Are we ready to go? Good afternoon, folks, and uh, I've uh, sustained the objection to the last, uh, so let's uh, proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Rittenhouse. Good afternoon. You testified earlier that there were times that evening when uh, Mr. Rosenbaum had threatened you. Is that right? Yes. And you described him as wearing a red shirt with a blue bandana. Is that correct? At, at certain times. Yeah. When he threatened you, that's what he was wearing? Uh, I believe the first time he threatened me, he was wearing a red shirt with the blue bandana. The second time, he had it wrapped around his face. 
had what wrapped around his face? His, his t-shirt. So he wasn't wearing a shirt the second time around? Correct. And you indicated at one point you thought he had a chain in his hand? I believe he so. When he uh, made the threat to you with the red shirt on and the blue bandana, did he have the chain in his hand? I think one of the times he did. Okay, and so which of the times was it? I can't recall off the top of my head. I'm, I think it was the time when he was threatening to cut people's hearts out. And I, I don't need to know the threat, I just need to know which time it was. Was it the first time or the second time? Second time, I, I, the second time. What was he wearing the second time? Uh, he, he was masked, well, the shirt wrapped around his face. And he didn't have the, he didn't have a shirt on his torso? Correct. Okay. And you could see, when he didn't have a shirt on his torso, that he didn't have any gun tucked in his waistband, correct? I wasn't paying attention to that, I was, I was behind Joanne Fiedler. I was somewhere over there. So how far away were you from Mr. Rosenbaum when he made the second threat? By uh, 15, 10, 15 feet, I'm, I'm not really certain. But you were close enough to hear the words out of his mouth? Yes. And you took that as a threat to you personally? I took the first one where he said, if I catch you alone, I'm gonna kill you. I took that as a threat to me personally. The second time I took that as a threat to the group. Can we have that uh, photo, uh, Exhibit 138, up on the screen, please? Do you see Mr. Rosenbaum in this picture? I do. And he's in the middle of the picture wearing the red shirt with the blue bandana carrying the plastic bag, correct? Yes. Is that the way he looked when he made the first threat to you? When he said, if I catch you alone, yes. And he was carrying that plastic bag with him when he made that threat too, correct? Correct. How close was he when he made that first threat to you? Close, I couldn't give you an exact estimate, but he was cl close, less than five feet. So closer than Madam Court Reporter is to you now? I'd say about the same, if not a little bit closer. And you were next to Mr. Balch when that was said? Correct. Was anyone else there besides you, Mr. Balch, and Mr. Rosenbaum? I believe there were other uh, demonstrators um, around. And you've seen in this trial that there's been a lot of video footage of that night, correct? Yes. And you've seen in this trial that there's a lot of video footage of you that night, correct? Yes. You'd agree with me that there's no video of either one of these threats, correct? I don't know if somebody filmed it um, that I'm aware of right now. You're not aware of any, are you? I'm not. So Mr. Rosenbaum looked like that at the time of the first threat but then looked different at the time of the second threat? Is that right? Yes. And did you say he was carrying the chain when he made the first threat or the second one? The second. Okay. And he was still carrying that plastic bag the second time? Yes. That plastic bag has a, has a clear side to it that allows you to see inside of it, right? Sorta, of, I didn't really look into the bag. So you didn't know what was in the bag at all? I didn't. Did he swing the chain at you when he made the second threat? He did not. Did he uh, physically touch you when he made the second threat? No, he didn't. In fact, that entire evening, he never once touched your, your body, did he? he? He grabbed my gun when he attacked me. And that's why I asked the question the way I did. He never touched your body that night, correct? He didn't touch me physically. Okay. And the, neither the first or the second time did he run at you or charge at you or anything like that, did he? He didn't chase me. He didn't even do anything physically aggressive to you, did he? No. He just said some words? Yes. And that chain that he had in his hand, he never did anything to physically threaten you with that chain, correct? Yes. Is that correct? That's correct. And other than the chain that you've described, at no point in the evening did you ever see 
Joseph Rosenbaum with any other type of weapon, correct? Not that I saw. Never saw him with a gun? Correct. Never saw him with a knife? Correct. Never saw him with a bat? Correct. Never saw him with a club? Correct. How far apart in time were these two threats that you say Mr. Rosenbaum made to you? I want to say, I, I can't give you an, a definite time. I wasn't looking at my clock, but I, I'd say within the same hour. And both of those threats occurred while you were on the 59th Street property? The, the, the second threat um, happened at the corner, and the first threat um, happened tr towards Ruther Central High School. Okay, could you use that laser pointer and, and uh, point out on that map where the first threat occurred? The first threat happened right here at the in front of the building. So you're pointing at a location that is by the 59th Street car source on the south side of that property uh, along the building and Sheridan Road on the west side of the road. Would that be accurate? Yes. Okay. And uh, you said there was a second threat within an hour after that, correct? Yes. Where was that threat at? It was somewhere over here, I remember, like on the other side of the property, towards mm -hmm. Ruther Central. More towards the northeast corner of that same property. Correct. But you were still on the car source property when that second threat was allegedly made, correct? Yes. Did you remember what Mr. Rosenbaum had said to you later on when he's confronting you at the 63rd Street car source? I took a mental picture of his face. Um, when, he threat when he said those threats, I recognized that was him that said that when he started chasing me. So when you are running away from him at the 63rd car Street car source, you're thinking to yourself, this is the guy who had made a threat to me earlier. Is that fair to say? I was thinking this is the guy that said, if he catches me alone, he'll kill me um, as I'm running away from him. The reason I asked Mr. Rosen, or Mr. Rittenhouse is, how did you know it was the same guy when he's changed the way he looks? His appearance, the shorts, his height. But in both of those instances that you've described, he's got something covering his face, either the blue bandana in one instance, or the red shirt in a different instance, correct? He was wearing the red shirt when he chased me around his head. So you remember that from the second time that you say he threatened you? Yes. And you thought to yourself, this is the same guy? Yes. So when you eventually were getting to the point where you're going down to the 63rd Street car source, right before the, sh the shooting, you recognized him as you're following him down the street, didn't you? I didn't follow Mr. Rosenbaum down the street. He was in front of you. You know that now, right? I, I know that now. But you didn't, you didn't see him ahead of you as you're walking down there that night? No, it was dark out. But you, at some point as you get close to the 63rd Street car source, start running towards that lot, right? Towards the fire that in the Duramax. And Mr. Rosenbaum is running ahead of you, isn't he? I don't... I don't believe so. But you decided you needed to run because of the fire in the Duramax? Yes. Why? What was so urgent? It was a fire. There's fires all over the place, so? I was getting to the fire to put it out. We'll, we'll get back to that in a second. You indicated that while you were at the 59th Street car source, you said you put out a, a fire at the church next door. Is that right? Yes. Did you hear Joanne Fiedler's testimony yesterday that when you guys went over there, somebody had put some sort of flammable liquid on the door? Did you hear that testimony? I did. I believe that was at referring to the Ruther Central High School. Okay. So when she described it as happening at the church, you think that was she was getting it confused? Yes. Say yes. Okay. So uh, whatever happened with this flammable liquid on the door. The point is, some other group, some other people 
put that out before you even got there. Correct. correct. Why did you feel that you uh, should go around off the 59th Street car source property and put out fires? To make sure my community didn't get burnt down and help. And when you say your community, you mean Kenosha? Yes. Again, you're from Antioch. You're not living in Kenosha at this time when this all happens, right? My dad lives in Kenosha. Lots of people live in Kenosha, but you didn't, right? My residence was in Antioch. Okay. But you felt like you wanted to do things to protect this community. Fair? The community that I was part of, yes. And you felt like it was appropriate for you to take matters into your own hands to put out fires, for example. put out fires by using a fire extinguisher, yes. Even though they weren't on the 59th Street property, correct? Correct. And were there other things that you decided it would be appropriate for you to go out there and take care of off the 59th Street property that night? I was walking around and asking people if they needed medical help. So you felt that you wanted to go out and um, help people help protect people, help people feel better, treat people, things like that, Perfect. even off the 59th Street. Property. Provide first aid. Normally in our regular society, that's something that we call 911 for, right? Normally, yes. Where, where are we headed? <coughs> I, I think that the defendant's decisions to go off that property and involve himself in other matters are relevant, Your Honor. Well, I'll let you pursue it, but... Um, um, and that's exactly how these shootings happen, so... Well, uh, that's what the trial is about. Uh, uh, Which is go, why go I think ahead, it's Go ahead, I, uh, <clears throat> go ahead. Normally, we would, if there's a fire, if there's somebody committing a crime, you call 911, right? Normally, yes. You didn't feel like you could do that that night, correct? I don't think that, I, I saw from the nights prior that um, the fire department wasn't responding to put out fires. Well, the nights before, there were businesses on fire along 22nd Avenue, there's the car source, uh, large-scale property fires on the prior nights, correct? Yes. On the night of August 25th, we didn't have any fires like that. We just had a couple dumpsters, smaller things, right? That I saw, yes. I didn't hear you, sir. That I saw, yes. But regardless of how big the fire is, um, you felt that night that calling 911 was not an option, correct? I didn't feel that if I called 911, anyone would, would show up. Which is why you decided to take care of it yourself, correct? That, to provide first aid and put out fires. To do the things that normally we would expect the police or the fire department to do, correct? To help, help people, yes. Could you please move that microphone a little closer so we can make sure we hear everything you're saying? You can, you can adjust it if you need to move it a little closer. Thank you. Let me, well, permit me to interrupt for just a moment. Uh, how's the temperature? Uh, how many are comfortable the way things are? Okay, I, I won't even ask the other side. Uh, see you ice cubes, there's nothing to worry about. <laughs> it must be blowing differently here. Go ahead, Mr. You came to Kenosha that night armed with the AR-15 and no other ways to physically defend yourself, correct? I had an AR-15, yes. Other than that, you had no other weapons or devices that you could use to defend yourself that night, correct? Yes. 
in, there's an interview in which you say you're not carrying anything non-lethal. Do you recall that? I do. You indicated in response to one of your attorney's questions that there was no friction with the protesters that night. Did I understand you correctly? By friction, you mean? Well, I'm using your words, sir. I, I heard you say, in response to your attorney's question, that there was no friction with the protesters that night. Did I hear you correctly? Uh, yes. Uh, and you're describing what you observed when you were at the 59th Street car source. Fair enough? Yes. So based on your several hours at that location, it seemed to you as though the crowd of however you want to describe them, they've been called rioters, protesters, demonstrators, and you, things were fine. No tension, no friction, no nothing. Fair to say? For the most part, other than Mr. Rosenbaum. He was the only one. That threatened, yes. That you saw? Yes. Can we please play exhibit number 18 at the one hour and 22 second and 14, I'm sorry, 22 minute and 14 second mark? Please play from this point. And uh, militia are up there. We need water. Yeah, we got a fire. Where? Oh, dumpster fire. Yeah, just a dumpster fire. Hey, it's just like the year, man. <laughs> yeah, right. If 2020 is a blunt, it would be just a fucking stem. It would just, yeah, it would just be stem and see, man. <laughs> yeah, right. I could use a doobie right now. Hey, cover me, I got All right, let's. Hey, guys. Water. How's it going? You guys want to fuck around and find out? Hey, 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 hey. You won't reel in. Reel in. Reel in. Don't cause problems when there's none here. Yeah, that's true. Just stay on your property. Let the, this, otherwise, you're gonna pop, there's way too many of them. There. I have to agree with her. I have to agree with her that they shouldn't be on the street. They're just protecting their property. One of the guys is an asshole. I know, I thought they were yelling at them. I was like, why? Oh, no, well, well, we did well, get a lid on fire. One of the guys is losing his patience. He should go inside. Yeah, that's what we're about to send him. Yeah, if you guys could switch him out. Just that somebody's a uh, loose cannon. He, he's got a lot of rage. He says the wrong thing. This whole crowd burns you guys alive. Yeah. Protect your property, they're respecting that, just take, keep it there.
Do you think that looks like friction? A little bit. And you witnessed that, didn't you? I didn't was witness what Mr. Uh, Collette did. I didn't see that. But you saw the reaction from the crowd, right? Yeah, a little bit. I wasn't really paying much attention to that. Would you agree with me that it seems that the crowd was reacting to members of your group going out in the street and trying to interfere w with what was going on off your property? I don't think they were happy about it. Um, and in fact, Kristan Harris, who made this video, specifically told you to stay on your property <coughs> and not go out on the street and try and put out fires or interfere with any of that stuff. Just protect your property. Isn't that what he told you? I believe so. I was just going to grab the garbage can, uh, the dumpster that belonged to the car source that was on the car source property. This is before you headed south towards the 63rd Street car source, right? Yes. This is before you decided to go down there with a fire extinguisher, correct? Yes. This is before you shot Mr. Rosenbaum, Mr. Huber, Mr. Grosskreutz, and at the person that was jumping over you, correct? Yes. So you knew that this was a crowd that would not react very favorably to you going out there and trying to put out fires or interfere with any of that stuff. You knew that, didn't you? I didn't. Even after that incident, you still didn't have any idea that this is a crowd that's not going to take it very well. It seems like they were more mad at the part of him screaming what he screamed after, not putting out the fire. That's what it seemed like to me. And he screams to them, fuck around and find out, right? That's what he screamed to them. After they had just tried to light a dumpster on fire, right? Yes. So what did you interpret that to mean? I don't know. I didn't witness in the time. I just grabbed the dumpster a minute after and tried to pull it onto the property. Because it seems to me he's saying, you light stuff on fire and I'm going to use my gun. Your Honor, that's a total I'll, I'll withdraw the question. And then withdraw. Yeah, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter what you, what it seems to you. You can ask your questions. That's fine. Go ahead. It was shortly after that incident that we just watched where you were interviewed by Richie McGinnis, correct? Yes. And you said you've never, never heard of him, never dealt with him before this night? I have not. Okay. So why did you talk to him? He seemed like a nice guy. Did he introduce himself as from the media? Uh, he didn't specifically said, hey, I'm from the media. He was like, hey, do you want to do an interview? And when you heard him ask you to do an interview, you didn't think that many's from the media? No, I, it's not what I said. I said he didn't specifically say he was from the media. Okay, but you, you assumed when he says, I'm going to interview you, that he's from the media, right? Yes. And did he tell you he's from the Daily Caller? He did not. So you didn't know what media company he worked for? Correct but you agreed to have him interview you on camera, correct? Yes. Can we please play exhibit number 16? Yes. 
and you indicate that you're going to run out there and treat anyone who needs medical help, correct? Yes. Were you going to bring the gun along when you did that? Yes. To defend yourself while you're treating someone? If I needed to defend myself if, while treating somebody, yes. If you didn't think there was friction with the crowd, and you're out there trying to help, why did you expect there'd be any danger? From the previous nights when I saw people being assaulted. Were they medics being assaulted? I don't know who they were. I know one of them was just trying to put out a fire at his business. So you saw someone put out a fi who was trying to put out a fire who got assaulted? Yes. But I, if you're going to help people, why would you expect anyone to try and hurt you? I don't know. Um, somebody did try to hurt me, and I was helping people. Well, that came, you're talking about later on. Yes. Okay, but at this moment in time, this is before the shootings. Yes. This is before you cross 60th, before you deal with Rosenbaum, Huber, Grosskreutz, all that, right? Yes. So at this moment in time, you don't think there's a hostile crowd, you're there to help people, and yet you're going to run out there with the AR-15. I don't understand why you felt that you were going to be in danger if you're out in a friendly, what you think is a friendly crowd, helping them. I didn't... I didn't say I didn't think they were hostile. I didn't think they were hostile towards us. Okay, so they're not hostile to you and you're going to go help them. Why do you need the gun when you go out there? Um, I, I need the gun because if I had to protect myself because somebody attacked me. Why would you think anybody would do that? I don't know. But you clearly planned on it. You were prepared for it. You thought it was going to happen. No, I didn't. That's the whole reason you brought the gun. Isn't it? I brought the gun to protect myself. Exactly. Because you thought you personally were going to be in danger. Right? Not necessarily. I don't understand. You said you're going to bring the gun to protect yourself. So you thought you were going to be in danger. Right? I didn't think I would be put into a situation to where I would have to defend myself. You said that the people around you on that property and the people up on the roof were there to protect you. That's what you said in the video, right? Yes. You meant when you go out in the crowd, they're, they're, they're going to protect you, right? Watch over me, yes. Watch over and protect you, right? Yes. Again, because you expected that if you go out in that crowd to try and provide medical service, you thought you were going to get attacked? They were to watch me, they were on the roof to watch me, and if somebody was to attack me in their view, they could say, hey, Kyle, watch out. They've got AR-15s. Yes. We talked earlier about the fact that the AR-15, you can't use deadly force to protect the building, right? Correct. The AR-15 was to protect you, right? That's what you just said. Not the AR-15, I said... They could shout down to me and be like, hey, Kyle, watch out. So they're just carrying around the AR-15s for no reason? I don't know why they're carrying around the AR-15s. Can we play exhibit? Uh, at th at this is the end. At the end of this video is where you invite Mr. McGinnis to follow you and Ryan Balch, correct? Yes. And you invited him to do that because you want, I think you said on, when your attorney was asking you questions, that you wanted him to film you while you were out in the crowd doing your thing. Okay? I, yeah, I said it was okay for him to film me. Let's play exhibit uh, 17, please.
just asked you, so you're a certified EMT, and you said yes, correct? Yes. That was a lie, correct? I'm not an EMT. You're not a certified EMT. You're not an EMT of any kind. You weren't on that night, correct? Yes. So you lied to him, correct? I told him I was, I told him I was an EMT, but I wasn't. And you knew you were being interviewed by someone in the media when you told that lie, didn't you? Yes. Please continue. And you work as an EMT in Harlem? Back up 10 seconds, please. And then just pause right there. We just heard um, a voice say something to you, Mr. Balch, about people throwing rocks or something along those lines. I don't really need to know exactly what they said, but did you hear that voice? The police officer from the Bearcat, yes. That's what I was going to ask. That's one of the law enforcement officers in that armored vehicle that you're walking past, correct? Yes. And this what we're watching in this video happens um, a few minutes after those same Bearcats had come to the 59th Street property and handed you some bottles of water, correct? Yes. And they say to you something to the effect of, we appreciate you guys. Do you remember that? I do. That's when you were on the 59th Street property and you were acting like you were guarding that property, correct? Yes. So how did it make you feel when the police are letting you pass the lines, they're warning you about people throwing rocks, they're handing out bottles of water, they're telling you that they appreciate you. How'd that make you feel? I didn't really care. I was thankful for the water because I had OC, OC stuff, gas in my eyes, but I didn't really notice or care. It didn't make you feel like they approved of what you were doing? No. It didn't make you feel like you're emboldened now to go out there and act on their behalf? No. Let's play the video here, please. Cross. You yelled something friendly, friendly, friendly. I'm not sure how many times, but you yelled friendly out. Yes. This is... Uh, if I can use the pointer, you are crossing on the west side of Sheridan Road. You are crossing south across 60th Street here, uh, heading across the police line, which had barricaded across 60th and Sheridan. Fair? Yes. You understood at this moment that you are now entering a crowd of whatever you want to call them, protesters, demonstrators, your attorneys called them rioters or looters or whatever. That's who you're going to now be part of. You're going to be in that crowd, right? I was walking through. I announced myself as friendly and that I was there to help them. Because you had to do that to warn these people that, hey, I'm on your side, right? I told them that I was friendly. Because if you didn't say that, you were worried they would see you as hostile. Correct? Can, can you uh, re-ask your question? I, like, sure. I, I'm trying to understand. Absolutely. If you're going to go up to Dominic Black or Ryan Balch, you don't need to tell them you're friendly because they know that you're friends, right? We don't, we don't tell this to our friends. Yeah. We say friendly to people that aren't our friends, people that might be hostile to us, right? Yeah, I, I said it to them because they were throwing rocks at me, and when I told them I was friendly, they stopped throwing rocks at us. And to be accurate, they were the, throwing the, the Bearcats, not at you. Yeah. One of them hit one of the armored vehicles and bounced off towards you and Mr. Balch, right? Yeah. It didn't do any damage to that armored vehicle, did it? 
Not that I'm aware of. I mean, can you imagine trying to harm an armored vehicle with a rock? That's pretty hard to do, right? Yeah. But they weren't, no one was throwing rocks at you, but you were kind of in the ricochet line of fire. Is fair yeah. to say? Yeah. So you wanted to let these people know that, hey, I might look like I'm on the other side, but I'm really friendly. Fair? I wasn't on any side, but... I didn't say that. I said that you, you might appear to them. I mean, that was what you were worried about, right? When you said friendly? And I, I notice you looking over at your attorney a lot. Can you... I'm, I'm trying to ask you. When you are Connor, doing... This, that. He's looking directly at Mr. Binger, and I'm behind him. He, he accused... Mr. Rittenhouse is looking at his attorney. Does he want him to look at the ceiling? I'll continue, Your Honor. You, at this very moment, announced yourself as friendly because you were worried that the people on the other side of that street would see you as hostile. Fair? I don't, I, I can't tell you how I think they would see me, but I just told them I was friendly. And I want to make sure you understand my question, because I was asking you what you thought when you said this. You said you announced yourself as friendly because you thought to yourself at that very moment, I'm walking into a group that is hostile to me. Isn't that true? It looked hostile. They were throwing rocks at the squad car, not the squad cars, the armored police cars. And you felt it was necessary to tell them, friendly, 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 so that they wouldn't do anything to you. Fair? Yes. Let's continue the video. There's a person that comes up to you carrying a skateboard. Do you see that? I do. And he's got some fire extinguishers slung over his shoulder? Yes. And he says something to you about something, something, putting out fires, and you respond, they know, they know. Did I understand what you said correctly there, they know? That's what I just heard, but I don't, I don't remember that interaction very well other than helping the guy after with the shoulder. And that's going to come up in a second here, but when you're talking to this individual about the fire extinguishers, do you remember anything about that conversation? It's hard to recall, but I think it was about fires, that they were putting out fires. Okay. And when you said they know, they know, who's they? I don't recall. Do you have any idea what you were talking about? I, I don't. It seems to me, Mr. Rittenhouse, that this person is suggesting he's going to go put out some fires and you're sort of assuring him that it's, you don't need to, it's, it's okay. Would that be a fair interpretation or no? No. Okay. But you don't remember what was going yeah, on? I, I, I don't remember the conversation, what it was about, other than fires and I don't recall it. This is one of the guys in the group that you later got your fire extinguisher from, right? No. Okay. We'll get to that in a second. Let's continue. Brian, can you come to You good? people in this crowd if they need medical. Um, and you talked earlier about treating a couple, I don't know, somebody at the, at the 59th Street car source, right? Minor injuries. Minor injuries. When you were walking around outside that property, when you're out in the street announcing what you're announcing, did anybody respond and say, yeah, I need help from you? 
Yes. When was that? I don't recall an exact time, but somebody cut their finger open and I gave them some gauze and some bandage tape. Was that before or after this? Do you remember? Before. Um, where physically did that happen? I don't recall. And was this a situation where you announced or you know yelled out that you could help and then somebody said, yeah, I need some help? Was that what, what, what went on in that situation? Yes. Okay. As you're walking along here, from this point until the end, until you shoot Rosenbaum and Huber and Grosskreutz, no one in this crowd ever says to you, yeah, I do need medical. Come over and help me. Correct? Yes. That's correct? Yes. Okay. Let's continue. This is the individual who accuses you of pointing your gun at them, right? Yes. And he says that you did so when he was on a vehicle, right? Yes. And in fact, he had been at the 59th Street Car Source location, climbing on, sitting on, jumping on one of the vehicles in that lot, hadn't he? Not that I'm aware of. I and know I heard uh, Joanne Fiedler testify to that, but I don't, re I don't remember seeing him at that location. But he accuses you of that here. He does. And you tell him, Basically, yeah, I did point the gun at you, right? I, I shrugged it off and said, I, yeah, I did, sarcastically, meaning I didn't, but I just didn't want a confrontation, so I was like, I did, and walked away. Why did you lie to him? I didn't lie to him. I was, I was using sarcasm. The words you said, yeah, I did, those weren't true, were they? Your Honor, this is ridiculous. We're now fighting over sarcasm. This is a murder Your trial. Honor, When you told that individual, yeah, I did point a gun at you, that wasn't true, was it? I didn't point a gun at him. So why did you react to him that way in that particular moment? I thought that would be the best way to avoid conflict. I just said, yeah, I did, sarcastically, like, I don't know what you're talking about. What conflict were you trying to avoid? Any conflict, if he would have got... Like he was accusing me of something I didn't do, so I thought the best thing would be would be would the best thing to do would be to walk away instead of getting into some argument. So, but you didn't just walk away. You said to him sarcastically, "Yeah, I did." Sar I said sarcastically, "I did," and walked away because you were worried about a conflict. What conflict were you worried about? A verbal argument. This individual is clearly expressing to you that he's unhappy because he thought you pointed your gun at him, correct? Yes. And you can understand why someone would be upset when you point an AR-15 at them, correct? Yes. You knew that even before this, right? Yes. In fact, back at the 59th Street car source, that crowd that you've described as not, being, not having any friction, Many of that crowd got upset because they thought people in your group were pointing their laser pointers at them. Do you remember that? I saw it in the videos, but I don't know what other people were doing. I, I'm not saying anybody actually was. I'm saying the crowd was upset, and you knew that. You heard them complaining, correct? Watching the videos, yes. And even at that time, that night, you heard the crowd upset because they thought members of your group were pointing their laser pointers at them. Do you remember that from that night? Sort of, yes or no. I remember Ryan Bald saying something like telling the people to stop pointing their lasers at people or something. I don't, I don't really remember that. Ryan Balch was telling the people in your group to stop doing that. The people on the roof. Who were part of your group, right? That were, with the, that were there, yes. So you know when we're talking about laser pointers, we're talking about 
the sight at the end of some guns that helps almost like like this, right? If I if somebody does this at me, you know, that could be someone pointing a gun. Correct? It could be seen as that. And that's what the crowd was complaining about, right? Yeah. So you knew from that crowd incident, and you certainly knew from this incident, that when people have guns pointed at them, it can really escalate the situation. Correct? Yeah. I, yeah, I don't think anybody had lasers on their guns. I think... Yeah, but like, let's go back to your group at 59th Street, because you actually didn't know any of those people other than Dominic and Nick Smith, right? Yes. You had just met Ryan Balch for the first time three or four hours before this video, right? Yeah. You had just met Jason Lakowski for the first time, just actually only a few minutes before this, right? Because he didn't get in until 1045. Correct. So at this point in the video, I don't know, this is probably about 1130 or so at night? I met him about 35 minutes prior to that. And probably had only spent, what, 10, 15 minutes at all in the same location as Jason Lakowski before you walk south? Yes. So, again, Jason Lakowski was someone you'd never met before that night. Correct. And you barely spent any time with him that night. Correct? Correct. And, of course, the people up on the roof, other than Dominic Black and Nick Smith, you didn't know any of them before that night either. Correct? I knew Dominic Black and Nick Smith, but the people on the... I misspoke their yeah, names. Sorry. Dominic Black and Nick Smith. I knew those are the two people I knew on the roof. Other than that, you didn't know anyone else before this night. Fair? Correct. Now, when this little interaction that we've just watched happens, you're still walking with Ryan Balch, aren't you? I, I'm not. I thought I was at the time, but seeing hindsight view, I'm not. When you decided to cross 60th with Ryan Balch, you two talked about the fact that if you get separated, to go back to the 59th Street car source, right? I don't recall that conversation happening. But you tried to do that, didn't you? I, I did. Because you felt like if I'm out here by myself, that's not good. I need to head back, right? Yes. And you also talked to Ryan Balch about the fact that when you get out into this crowd, keep your mouth shut. Don't antagonize them. Didn't Ryan talk to you about that? No, we didn't talk about that. So at this very moment, you're telling us you've lost track of Ryan Balch. A little bit ahead, but around that time, yes. Let's continue the video. Boy, yesterday today. You have just walked off the screen, heading east across Sheridan Road to the Ultimate Gas Station, correct? Yes. And at that point in time, you don't know where Ryan Balch is, correct? I, when I stop and look around, yes. And instead of deciding to head back at this point, you go over to Ultimate Gas and you talk to some folks over there. Fair? I walk over to the Ultimate Gas Station, I walk around and I, I try to see if I can find Mr. Balch. And you couldn't do that? No. So then you decided to approach the police line and cross back, correct? To, I, yes. Because you decided your best course of action at that point would be to return to the same group that you'd been with, correct? Yes. Now, at that moment in time, the police had pushed everybody south of 60th, right? Sort of. I, I don't really know if there were... Did in, you say south of 60th? I said south of 60th. Oh, okay. Let, let's go back a little bit. We, we, we watched that interview with Richie McGinnis where he first comes up to you and talks to you, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Yes. And you're standing there at the 59th Street property, aren't you? I am. And he talks to you about what you're going to do and you're say you're going to run out and help people, things like that, right? Yes. At that point, the police had already passed with all the Bearcats and MRAPs and armored vehicles, right? That's what it looks like, yes. And they had established a line on 60th and Sheridan, correct? Yes. And they pushed all of the protesters, demonstrators, rioters, whatever you want to call them, all of them south of 60th, correct? I, I don't know if I can honestly answer all of them. I don't know. If, I believe there are some people still um, north down Sheridan 
and in the put across the street. So were there, I mean, we saw a crowd earlier of lots of protesters out in the street. That group, the numbers had dwindled quite a bit. Yes. Okay. So after the police move everybody south of 60th, there's no more actual threat to the 59th Street car source, is there? I, I don't know. Well, at that moment in time, what imminent threats did you see to the 59th Street car source property? I don't know. Do you remember seeing any protesters out in the street in front of the 59th Street car source after the police pushed everybody south of 60th? I believe there were some across the street, but not many. I, I, I can't recall completely. And that was just two or three people, right? I, I don't know how many people. None of those people came across the street to the 59th Street car source, did they? I don't know. By the, if they did, I would have walked off by now. So you didn't see them come across the street? I did not. Fair to say that after the police pushed everybody south of 60th, you never saw any people threatening that property, correct? I didn't see anybody. And your goal that night, you took it upon yourself to protect the 59th Street property, correct? The owners asked, asked. Sure, but you were gonna station yourself at that property to try and protect it from damage, fair? The car source locations, yes. And once the police had pushed everybody south of that, there was no more danger. At that car source location, yes. So, why not go home at that point? Because um, I still, the police were still pushing people back and then they were backing up and I was still helping people provide medical first aid. Okay, so the police had established the line at 60th with their Bearcats at that point. Right? Yes. And there was no indication that they were going to reverse and back up and move back north again that you saw, correct? No, they 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 did it earlier in the night where they did the same thing. Right, but this is at 11.30, 11.40 at night, and they've established that, the police have established that line, and as far as you can tell, it's going to stay there, right? I don't know. And you talked about trying to provide medical help, but there's no one around that needs medical help at the 59th Street car source at that point, is there? Uh, not that I noticed. So you don't have any purpose there anymore, do you? Other than... So why not go home? Because I was going to help people with provide first aid and medical assistance. But that wasn't the reason you were there that night. You were there that night to protect the 59th Street car source. It was one of the reasons I was there. Part of my reasons of being there was to protect the car source properties and provide first aid and medical assistance. So you went out in the crowd, like we see in this video, looking for anyone who needed your help. If somebody asked, that, they, if somebody said they need help, I would have helped them. So why go with Ryan Bulch? Because you're, you're safer and better in Paris when there's somebody else that's also with you. So when you cross 60th, you were worried about your safety? A little bit. Even though you think this is not a hostile crowd and you're there to help them, you were still worried about your safety. That's why you needed Bulch to back you up, right? I said I didn't think they were hostile towards me. I didn't say that they weren't a hostile crowd. So let me rephrase my question. That's to take that into account. You didn't think this was a crowd that was hostile to you personally, and you thought you were going to help them, but yet you also felt you needed a backup, an armed former Army infantryman to protect you. Fair? Yes. And yet when he's gone and you can't find him, you don't immediately go back, right? I look for him for a second, and then I think Max, I look for him for like three minutes and then I try to go back. And when you couldn't get back straight across the police lines, did you decide 
to try and go around the police lines. For example, the ultimate gas station is here at 60th and Sheridan. Why didn't you walk down the street here and go over this way and around? I don't know. Why didn't you go west over this way and go around? I don't know. I guess I. it was very close in time that I was heading back uh, that that I was turned down by the police before I got the phone call from Dominic Black. So I guess I didn't have time to really think, like, which ways I can go around. You knew the layout of downtown Kenosha, right? Because you said you drove that area the whole time, right? A little bit. So you go over to the Ultimate Gas Station, and you spend some time talking with folks that are there who are similarly dressed as you. They've got similar clothing, similar weapon, things like that, right? Similar weapons, I, was, I, don't, I wouldn't say similarly dressed. But you went over there because you felt that those were people doing something similar to what you were doing that night, fair? I thought that would be the safest spot for me to go. Why did you think you'd be safe with those people? Because I was alone and they were, like I said, you're better in pairs and I didn't want to be alone in, in that situation. You didn't want to be alone out here with this crowd that we see on the screen right now. I right? did not want to be alone with them. You wanted to be with the group at Ultimate Gas that had AR-15s like you, right? I wanted to be um, back at the car source where there weren't people around. Right, and we've talked about that, but, but initially you go to Ultimate Gas. To and, look for Ryan, yes. But you also talk to people who have AR-15s just like you, right? I, I wouldn't say I talked to them. I asked After the phone call, I asked a guy for a fire extinguisher to come with me. Let's uh, play exhibit number 11 at the 54 minute and 30 second mark. This is the Corey Elijah live stream when he's in the ultimate gas lot. Mr. Rittenhouse, that's Ryan Balch standing. Yes standing there in the ultimate gas lot, correct? Yes. Let's play this video. saw you run through this video, correct? Yes. I started this video at the 54 minute and 30 second mark. It is now paused at the 54 minute and 56 second mark. So for 26 seconds, Corey Elijah has Ryan Balch on screen, center of this video during that entire time, right? Yes. And you run right past where Corey Elijah is standing, right? Yes. And Ryan Balch is loitering there in the middle of the screen for at least 26 seconds, right? That's what it looks like on the screen. And your testimony is you were trying your best to find Ryan Balch at the ultimate gas station at this point because you needed him to protect you? I was looking for Ryan Balch, but I didn't notice him as I was running away, uh, not running away, running towards Car Source 3. But for 26 seconds before you start running, he's standing right there, isn't he? Yes, and I, when, when he's standing right there, bef before I run with the fire extinguisher, I'm, 
I'm over here on the phone with Dominic Black. How long was your phone call with Dominic Black? About 30 seconds. Okay, so before that, you'd been looking for Ryan Balch? Before that, I tried to get back to the um, car source lot number one. And you'd also been looking for Ryan Balch? Looking, yeah, seeing if I could see him in the crowd of people. Because you wanted a partner, a buddy, to protect you? To protect each other, yes. And in fact, when you borrowed that fire extinguisher, you asked someone in that group to come along with you, right? Yes. Because you wanted someone there to protect you when you go down and put out what you think are some fires, right? Yes. Because you know that you're running into a crowd that is not friendly to you, right? No. That's why you had to say the word friendly, 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 because you knew this was a crowd that would not see you as friendly, correct? I screamed friendly, friendly, friendly because somebody screamed burn inside. I'm talking about when you cross 60th. You yelled at them. At that time, yes. But and no one in the crowd is yelling burn inside or anything along those lines, are they? Not at that time. And you also wanted someone from that group to come along with you when you're going to go down and put out a fire because you knew full well that anyone running around like you putting fires out is going to cause a reaction in the crowd, a hostile reaction, correct? I didn't think it would cause a negative reaction. I wanted somebody to come with me because you're better in pairs and I thought there were other people at that car source before I got there. Well, Dominic, if you're telling us that Dominic Black called you to run three blocks down the road to put out a fire at the 63rd Street car source, then you must have known at that moment that there wasn't anyone else down there, right? Why would you need to go if somebody's already down there? Mr. Black said to me on the phone, hey, they're setting fires at the other car source. I need you to get down there and put out the fires. It must not have, I don't think it, I took it as there's not other people down there. Why would you need to go three blocks down if there were already people there? To help. He's asking you a question. This witness doesn't know the answer, whether there are people there or not. He's told us he thought there were, so I'm probing the basis of that and his understanding at the time. You can answer if I understand the question. I'll repeat the question. Why would you need to run three blocks down to the 63rd car source if you thought there were already people there? I thought there were people there, but I, Dominic asked me to go down there. I thought that was to help put out the fires that were down there. You're, you, this video that we're watching is minutes after you've left the 59th Street car source, right? Yes. And when you leave the 59th Street car source, you're with Ryan Balch. Yes. And then this reporter, Richie McGinnis. Yes. And as far as you know, when you leave 59th Street car source, everybody in your group is still back there, right? At the car source. At 59th Street car yes. source. Yes. Everybody's still back there. Yes. Joanne Fiedler. Yes. Dustin Collette. Dominic Black. Nick Smith. Jason Lakowski. Anyone else? They're all still there, right? At that location, yes. So none of your group is already down at 63rd Street Car Source, right? The other group that showed up after we got done taking the pictures with the, I, I think I said two or three vans, I believe they were still down there. And that was two or three vans of people that came out with what have been described as melee weapons, right? Like bats and clubs and things like that. Do you recall that? First of all, do you recall that testimony? I, I do. Do you remember seeing those two or three vans come to that location? I, I do. Do you remember seeing people get out of those vans? Yes, I, I saw, I think there were six people um, They, in total. And you saw them with weapons? I saw them with, I saw them with rifles. I don't think I remember melee weapons. They were armed, correct? Yes. And you believed that they were going to be the ones protecting the 63rd Street car source, correct? Yes. So at this point in time in the evening, had anybody told you that those folks had left the 63rd Street car source? No. So when you're running with this fire extinguisher, you think there's already a group 
that's designated to that spot that's still down there, right? Yes. So again, why do you feel that you needed to run three blocks down there with a fire extinguisher if you thought there were already people down there protecting that property? Because I, Dominic called me and asked me to go help put out the fires down there. And in that phone call, Dominic never told you that any of the members of the 59th Street group that you were part of, he never said any of them were down there at 63rd, right? Yes. And he never told you that the group that was supposed to be down there, he never told you anything about them, whether they were there or not there. He never mentioned that. Fair? It, it didn't come up. And you asked the people that you got the fire extinguisher to, uh, from to come with you, right? Yes. You were looking for Ryan Balch for backup, right? I was looking around for him, yes. You had already tried to go back to the 59th Street location, right? Yes. And all of those failed? Yes. So then you decide to take it upon yourself to head down to 63rd Street to put out fires. Fair? I wouldn't say that. I would say I want to go put down, put put out the fires that I was there to do. When, by, when I say protect the property, I mean by like put out fires. So I went to go put out the fires. I just believe there are people there. And you brought your AR-15 along? Yes. Why? Because it was with me already. Yeah, but you'd taken it off earlier when you were treating someone. You gave it to Joanne Fiedler, right? Yes. So you know how to take it off, don't you? Yes. And you can make a choice on your own whether or not to go armed with it or whether to give it to the person who is the lawful owner of it on that date, Dominic Black. Correct? I didn't take my rifle off there because there was nobody I could hand it to. Um, and when I took it off to hand it to Joanne Fiedler, I was in a safe spot in the corner of the building where there were people protecting me at that time right there. When I went to go to the car search number three to put out the fire, there was nobody I could hand my rifle to that could protect me while I'm providing first aid to somebody. But you still knew you had it. My you rifle, yes. You still knew you had it strapped around your body. Yes. And you made a conscious decision to bring it along, right? Yes. Why? He has an answer. He, he gave an answer about how he already had it. And we we go through on that. So, I, I did, but I don't really understand what... Well, you... Was it simply that, well, I've already got it strapped on, so I might as well bring it along? Is that what you're telling us? You decided to bring along the AR-15 because, well, I've already got it? Is that your answer? I, I don't think I was thinking, to like, hey, I'm going to take my rifle off. I, I wouldn't have because the, I, there was people around that could have stolen my gun, and I didn't... I didn't take my rifle off because I was going there alone. I, I was going to be running there alone, and I didn't. I didn't take it off because no one else was there to protect me um, as I was going there. So I, that's why I brought it for protection. Yes. You brought it along down there because you felt like you would need to protect yourself against someone else harming you. Correct. If that would have happened, I would have protected myself, but I, I didn't think I was going to be attacked and ambushed. But you just said you had it for protection. What were you expecting you would need protection from? I, I, I thought we had covered much of this before. I'm specifically focusing in on the time period where he is heading down to the 63rd car, Street car source. I have not asked him about this yet, Your Honor. Well, go ahead. But uh, you need to pick up the pace somewhat. When you decided to bring your AR-15 loaded with 30 rounds down to the 63rd Street source, car source location, what did you think you needed protection against? I didn't really think I was going to have to protect myself. You told us just now you brought it along for protection. I did, but I didn't think I was going to need to protect myself. You brought it along for protection, but you didn't think you needed protection? It's not what you said. Objection. 
I'm trying to clarify the two different answers that I think he just gave, Your Honor. Well, that, it, it, go ahead. Can you? Do you, you understand, understand the question? question? Not really. I asked you why you brought the gun. You said you needed it for protection. I said protection against what? You said you didn't think you needed protection. I'm confused. Can you help me understand why you're telling us you needed a gun for protection, but you didn't think you needed protection? I brought the gun for my protection, but what I was saying is I didn't think I would have to use the gun and end up defending myself. So you, in this video, are running. Yes. You run across the screen. Yes? Yes. And then I think you testified on direct that as you made it down the block, you, I don't remember exactly how you phrased it, but you, you, you stopped running and you, you walked for a little while. Is that right? I jogged and walked occasionally. Carrying the fire extinguisher and your gun. Yes. And you're alone at that point with no backup, right? Yes. And you testified that when you got down to the 63rd Street car source, you indicated that you came upon that vehicle we've been calling the Duramax. You know what vehicle I'm talking about? I do. And you indicated that when you got there, you walked around that vehicle and you saw a person that you now know to be Joshua Zeminski. Is that right? I, I walked up to the Duramax. Yes. You didn't know Joshua Zeminski's name at that point, correct? No. You hadn't taken any notice of him at all up until that moment, all night long. Fair? Fair. This is the first time that you see that this is a person that comes to your attention. Fair? Yes. And you said he had a gun in his hand. Yes. And you put the fire extinguisher down on the ground. I, I dropped the fire extinguisher. And then you hear or see Mr. Rosenbaum coming from behind you? I, when I get to the Duramax, I step forward and then Mr. Zeminski turns towards me and he steps towards me. I drop the fire extinguisher, step back, and that's when I see, I, I, I go to run back towards 59th Street. And Mr. Rosenbaum is coming. And then I, that's when I noticed Mr. Rosenbaum running at me, leaving me with no other, right? Mr. Zeminski in front of me with the gun. M Mrs. Zeminski right there, um, a couple feet away, and then some other people I, there. And then the chase happens. Is that yes. fair to say? Yes. Have you told us everything that you did when that situation just happened at the Duramax. Yes. Can we play the iPad, please? The iPad with the drone video. This is exhibit number 73. I don't know if you, what are you guys going to do? Mr. Rittenhouse, this is a video that has been admitted into evidence as exhibit number 73. This is a video taken by a drone that was hovering south of 63rd uh, at the time that you shot Mr. Uh, Rosenbaum. We're going to play the beginning of this video on the iPad and I'm going to have Detective Howard uh, use the pinch and zoom feature on the iPad to zoom in on the area 
outside the presence of the jury. What do you think? Perfect time for a break, don't you think? Uh, let's take a break. Please don't talk about the case uh, during the break. Read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Um, what's up? Your Honor. What, excuse me, what? I think they went upstairs, though. Uh, go ahead. Your Honor, I don't know what the state's going to do next, but I suspect that it's something along the lines of they're going to use the iPad, and Mr. Binger was talking about pinching the screen iPads, which are made by Apple, have artificial intelligence in them that allow things to be viewed through three dimensions and logarithms. A logarithms, I don't understand it all either. Um, and it uses artificial intelligence or their logarithms to create what they believe is happening. So this isn't actually enhanced video. This is Apple's iPad programming creating what it thinks is there, not what necessarily is there. And I don't know what's going to happen, but we had this video enhanced. We have testimony regarding it. And this is one of the topics that came up. I asked my expert, I said, do you know of anything that does something like that? Because that was when Detective Antaramian testified about pinching his telephone and that's what I was told and that's what I think this is going and I don't think that it's appropriate it's it's wrong Mr. Binger your honor I think everybody in the in this room has a smartphone whether it's an Apple iPhone or some other device and I think uh, we've all taken a photograph or a video at one point or another and used the the pinch to zoom in feature. This is a common part of everyone's everyday life. Um, in the olden days, you had a photograph and a, mic and a magnifying glass, right? That doesn't change the photograph. When you use a magnifying glass to look at words on a paper or a photograph, the magnifying glass doesn't change the image. It doesn't change the pickles, pixels on the paper. It doesn't change the words in the book. All it does is make them easier to see. The pinch and zoom feature on the iPad or the iPhone or an Android phone, whatever device everyone in this room has, does that exact same thing. Now, if counsel has an expert who will say that this is unreliable or distorting the image or something along those lines, even though this is something everybody in this room has done with countless videos and photos throughout the last 20 year, 10 years of our lives here, um, this is a fact, this is a feature of everyday life in America now with smartphones. If they want to have an expert come in and say it's unreliable and you can't believe what's on that screen, they can do that. We're still in their case. And then the jury can make a decision as to whether or not pinching and zooming on an iPad or an iPhone is tampering with the video or altering the image or unreliable or shouldn't be given any weight. So, if they want to make a jury question out of this, they are free to do so. We're still in their case in chief. But I don't, frankly, understand or agree with anything counsel just said. I've used my phone. I think probably you have too. I think this is something within everyone's common knowledge to pinch and zoom on a screen. And that's what's going on here. It does not change the image in any way. It just no, makes like a saying, glass. Well, I don't know. 
when I put the magnifying glass up, then it's enlarging the image. It is not altering the image. What he's saying, and I think, and I, bless, I know less than anyone in the room here, I'm sure about all this stuff, but uh, I'm hearing him to say that they're actually artificially inserting pixels into there, which is altering the object which is being portrayed. And so, you know what, I, I, myself, when confronted with these changes in technology, what I usually do is to have, to admit the evidence, but uh, make sure that the finder of fact is aware of the fact that it is not the original image and the method by which it's been enhanced. Uh, you're suggesting that I should make the defense bring in an expert for it. My, my thought would be that actually you're the one who's offering the exhibit, so you should be in a position to offer evidence uh, as to the fact that it is not distorting the uh, object which is depicted. I, I would submit, Your Honor, that I think it's common sense to everyone in this room that that's not what's going on here. And what counsel is saying about Apple software and logarithms and things like that is not something that people in this room are familiar with. I, I thought I heard the experts say on the stand, and believe me, again, it's this is not something I'm familiar with, but I thought I heard the experts say that you brought down in from the crime lab that in fact that there were alterations made by adding pixels. That's an alteration of the image. So I don't have any problem with it being received, but you're going to have to have someone testify that it's a reliable, I don't want to say mirror image, but uh, uh, because obviously if you insert more items into a, an area of space, it's going to distort what's depicted. I think, Your Honor, when the pinch and zoom maneuver is used on a screen, it, it, it actually, um, it, it almost, it, it, it takes the high resolution that we see here and it brings it into the point where the pixels are actually spread out more. I don't, you know what, I'm not gonna, ex I'm not gonna accept as accurate what Richards is saying, and I'm not going to accept what you're telling me. I said if you can offer somebody who's knowledgeable in these areas the document or the, uh, the I think you should be allowed to use the image, but I, this is high risk. It, it, to me, if, uh, to me if, if, if you insert more data into a, a, an area of space, well, you're nagging, wagging your head no, no Tell me where I'm wrong. There's no proof in this record that we're doing that, Your Honor. I didn't say there was proof of it. I said you have the burden of proof. You're the proponent of the exhibit, and you need to tell me that it's reliable. The, the exhibit's already in evidence, Your Honor. That I know. The enhanced exhibit is not in evidence. This is not enhancing. Then well, then, if, the then why show it? I, I mean, the reason you want to show it is so because it enhances the image, right? No, one, no, 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 one at a time. I'll, I'll say what Mr. Krause was just saying. The, the defense has taken videos and photos and cropped them, zoomed in on them uh, on many exhibits in this trial. And this is, again, like I said, the magnifying glass is not changing the image. What the expert testified to about his software program was that he used video editing software used by the crime lab with pinching and zooming on an iPhone. They're, they're different software programs, different procedures, and I don't think it's fair to extrapolate this. The, every one of those jurors is familiar with this process. This is a, a, a fundamental part of our lives nowadays. It's much like 100 years ago people used magnifying glasses. This is no different than that. And if I think this is common knowledge, and I don't think I need any sort of expertise on this issue. If the defense wants to quibble with it, they have an expert who can offer testimony. But the exhibit's already in evidence. It would be well, no first off, me for first off, off a, a photograph of it and then, and then holding up an, uh, an enlargement. I mean, we had a guy coming yesterday with Walgreens prints. I mean, this is, this is what is done with photographs all the time. There's enlargements done in the lab. It doesn't change the pixels. Don't, no, no, no. You, you know, I don't want to hear about what happened earlier in the trial that came in without objection. If you didn't object, then I didn't address it. Now, I'm not going to police this case so everybody 
any, anytime somebody wants to put some evidence in, I'm going to say, well, wait a minute, what about that? What about that? I have to have an objection. I get an objection, and then I rule on it. There has been no objection during this trial when either side has exploded an image or, or anything like that. If you'd have brought in an objection, if he'd have brought in an objection, I would have ruled on it. But to, to say now, well, this has already been done during the trial. I've got an objection in front of me now. He's suggesting that the uh, amplifying the image uh, is, uh, is altering what is portrayed, the image which is portrayed. And you're giving me as a defense, it's no different from using a magnifying glass. I don't believe that. Because if I take, you know, the image is the same, and all it is doing is improving my poor old vision. Uh, here, you've got someone, to correct me if I'm wrong, I do believe the expert that, uh, testified that he had inserted, or the, either the, him or the device, inserted additional pix pixels into the image. That... Different program, yeah. Well, I don't know what kind of a program, I don't care what kind of a program it is. The question is, is the, is the, is the image in its virginal state? I, I, I care about what program it is, Your Honor, because these are, these are technical issues. Mr. Richards has just made representations with no basis whatsoever. Can you slow down? Absolutely. Mr. Richards has just made technical representations with no basis in this record whatsoever. He is questioning a common part of life that we use, everyone uses, every single day. The expert who testified was talking about a different software program, and it does make a difference. I don't know. Well, then, you're, then you're if it's going to be an system. issue, let's well, let's you're make the proponent. Issue. I said before, I'm not going to talk about it further. You're the proponent, and you need to uh, assure me before I let the jury um, uh, uh, speculate on it that it is a reliable method that does that does not distort what is depicted so okay I, so we're gonna take a break I understood you correctly we can play it now and then we'll tie it up later I don't think that's what I said that's what I thought you said so that's why I'm asking yeah I don't know maybe I, I, I did if I said that uh, shame on me I said I said that we're going to take a break right now and I said, before I'm going to allow this to be uh, amplified in the way that you want, it is going to have to be shown, demonstrated to me, that it's a reliable way to do it. Then we would request an adjournment to do that now. Well, we're not going to adjourn the case now to do that. Well, before I am done with my cross-examination of this witness, I would like to use this video, and I will need some time to make arrangements for what you're asking. So I would ask that before I am, uh, I would like time to do that before I'm done cross-examining this witness because this is an important exhibit that I intend to use with well, this witness. Well, it depends. Why don't you get on it right away and, you know, maybe you can get somebody to uh, testify on this within minutes. I don't know. So we'll take a break. Uh, what let's operating system are they using on the iPad? We can answer that question. Do you know? Not off the top of my head. Thank you. Well, iPad market. Okay. Uh, let's aim for uh, 320 on that clock, which is, yeah, let's aim for 
got one in the back. Ladies and gentlemen, Drake, I'm going to move that uh, TV in front centrally. We're going to watch exhibit number 82. This is a um, uh, version of the uh, drone footage that was introduced by our expert, James Armstrong, yesterday. And I'd like to be able to put this TV centrally so everybody can see it. So if you could let us know if, if you're able to see it uh, when we move it, please. Oh, yeah, I'll turn them up. As we play this video, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I would Please play that again. I'm going to have you pause at a, at a moment right at the beginning. Pause. Now, Mr. Rittenhouse, you told us earlier everything that you did when you first got to this location, correct? Yes. What you didn't tell us is that right here on the video, 
You have your gun raised, don't you? I, I, I can't see it. You know what? This is a nice uh, 4K uh, TV. I'm going to turn it a little bit towards you. Are you able to see that, that screen okay? I, I don't think all the jurors can see it now. I want to be able to play it for the defendant to be able to see it up I understand. Right? I'm just thinking if, if perhaps he could uh, take the chair that the officer is in right now. And do you want to Why go over there as well? Would you, uh, would it be easier, Mr. Rittenhouse, if you came and stood a little closer to that screen? Is that the same definition? Well, you know, and you're using the pointer. Uh, so we want to all be looking at the same TV. Okay. Okay. Um, would would it be appropriate for Mr. Rittenhouse to come sure. stand closer to the TV? As long as he doesn't, as long as he doesn't block the jurors, he and Mr. Richards can go over here. All right. And, let's. Uh, uh, I'll move this back. We can stand right down, down there if you would, please. Let's go back to the beginning of the video, please. I'm going to tell you when to pause. Don't want to tell So can you see in that video that you raised your weapon and pointed it at someone? I, I can't tell. This Let's play it one more time. Your Honor, he's, asked, he's answered the question. He says he can't see, so I'm trying to help him see. Go ahead. Pause. Pause the video. It doesn't look like I raised my rifle. It looks like my shoulder's up, but my rifle's pointed downward. Thank you. So your testimony today, today under oath is that you have no memory of raising and pointing your rifle when you first got to that location. Is that right? Yes. You see yourself put the fire extinguisher down. I see myself drop it, yes. Let's play exhibit 84 now, please. you have turned around and you are pointing your weapon at Mr. Rosenbaum, correct? Yes. And there's a point. Let's continue the video, please. All right, let's pause. Go back and uh, start at the beginning again, please. Just 
why don't you go back to the beginning, hit play, and I'll try and pause you a little bit better. Pause. There's a point where Mr. Rosenbaum is running after you where he raises his hands and leaps up in the air, correct? I wouldn't say he leaped in the air. I'd say he, like, he continued to run at me. He just threw his hands up. He threw both of his hands up in the air, right? Yes. And you could see that he was unarmed, correct? Yes. Please continue the video. Pause. Joseph Rosenbaum never touched you in any way during that incident, correct? He touched my gun. He didn't touch your body in any way, did he? No. He didn't kick you? No. He didn't punch you? No. Other than that plastic bag, he didn't throw anything at you? No. He didn't have a gun on him? No. He didn't have a knife on him? No. He didn't have a chain on him? No. He didn't have a bat on him? No. He didn't have any weapon of any kind, correct? Other than him grabbing my gun, no. Well, he didn't have possession of that gun. You did, correct? I was holding it, yes. And it was strapped to your body, correct? Yes. At all times during this incident, you retained possession of your AR-15, correct? Yes. Can we please play exhibit, I apologize, Brian, I don't know if I mentioned this one earlier, e I think it's 83. It's the full speed version of what we just saw. That was 84 just now, right? Okay, let's play 83, please. Mr. Rittenhouse, while you're watching this video, I'd like you to tell me if you see Mr. Rosenbaum Jump up in the air with his hands up, okay? Okay. Go ahead and play. All right, pause. Can we go back to the beginning, please? And play again. Pause. Right before Mr. Rosenbaum disappears behind that car, did you see him jump up in the air with his hands out? No, I saw him do something like this. Like That was a reaction to you pointing the gun at him, correct? Yes, but he kept running at me, so it didn't, it didn't deter him. But it slowed him down a little bit. He does this sort of jump with his hands in the air when you're pointing the gun at him, right? No, he continues to gain speed on me. Okay. Now let's uh, play exhibit 86, please. Did you slow down? Did I? Yeah. I turned around and I may have slowed down a little bit. It looks like you slowed down before you even turned around. Yes. You've I, characterized Mr. Rosenbaum as, as advancing on you, speeding up towards you, but you actually slowed down, didn't you? Because of the people around the cars, yes. But after the shooting, you run around those cars and head back towards the direction you originally wanted to go to, right? Yes. So those people didn't stop that, did they? They weren't there after I shot Mr. Rosenbaum. 
they scattered after you fired your gun four times, didn't they? Yes, they weren't there anymore. And you've heard Dr. Kelly's testimony that the first gunshot from you to Mr. Rosenbaum caused Mr. Rosenbaum to start falling to the ground. Did you hear that testimony? I, I did. And then you continued to fire three more shots into him after that, didn't you? I continued to fire until he was no longer a threat to me. When he's falling to the ground in front of you, he's no longer a threat to you. His pelvis is broken, right? I, I don't know. But he's fallen to the ground, isn't he? He's, I saw him lunging towards my gun, and he, I remember his hand on the barrel of my gun. Because he was trying to push it out of the way so you wouldn't shoot him. What was the risk to you of death or great bodily harm at the moment you killed Joseph Rosenbaum? If I would have let Mr. Rosenbaum take my firearm from me, he would have used it and killed me with it and probably killed more people if I would have let him get my gun. Mr. Rosenbaum never said anything to you about taking your gun, did he? He didn't say anything, but he tried to take my gun. And whoever's got that gun is a threat to everyone else? If, if he would have taken my gun, he would have used it against me. Let's break that down. First of all, you had already prevented him from taking your gun by running away and doing that little dip and dodge that Mr. McGinnis talked about, right? He was still coming after my gun. But you could have kept running. You could no, have turned I... back around like you did, couldn't you? No, I couldn't have. You have the gun strapped to your body at this moment, correct? Yes. The strap is designed to keep that on your body so it doesn't come off, correct? To, to help retain it, yes. And you have both hands on the gun, correct? Yes. And Mr. Ritten, or Mr. Rosenbaum has never said anything at all about wanting your gun. You never heard him say anything about that, correct? I haven't. You never said anything, he never said anything to you about using that gun at all, correct? I don't know what Mr. Rosenbaum was thinking when he tried to grab my gun. You just assumed that he was going to use it, that he was going to try and take it from you, first of all, and then you assumed he was going to try and use it on you. If I would have let Mr. Rosenbaum get my gun, he would have killed me. But you had already pointed your gun at him. Yes, because he was chasing me. Did you want him to think that you were going to shoot him? No, I never wanted to shoot Mr. Rosenbaum. Why'd you point it at him if you didn't have any intention of shooting? He was chasing me. I was alone. He threatened to kill me earlier in that night. I didn't want to have to shoot him. But you understand how dangerous it is to point a gun at someone, don't you? I pointed at him because he kept running at me and I didn't want him to chase me. But you understand how dangerous that is, don't you? I pointed at him because he was chasing me. I'll ask the question a third time, Mr. Rittenhouse. You understand. Uh, don't how comment. Um, uh, just ask your question. You understand how dangerous it is to point a gun at someone, correct? Yes. You understand that that puts someone else in fear. I pointed at him because he was chasing me. I'll ask the question a third time, Mr. Rittenhouse. You understand. Uh, don't comment. Um, uh, just ask your question. You understand how dangerous it is to point a gun at someone, correct? Yes. You understand that that puts someone else in fear that they're about to be killed, right? He was chasing me. You understand that when you point your AR-15 at someone else, that may make them feel like they are about to be killed by you, correct? Mr. Rosenbaum was chasing me. He said he was gonna kill me if he got me alone. I was alone. I was running from him. I pointed at him and it didn't stop him from continuing to chase me. Did you hear my question? 
Yes. Yet you chose not to answer. Objection, Your Honor. He answered. He just didn't like the answer. My question is, you understand that when you point your AR-15 at someone, it may make them feel like you're going to kill them, correct? Calls for speculation. Relevant. He asked if it, it would affect someone that way as, so as to perhaps deter the person. Do you understand my question? I do. Can you please answer it? I did. I said, I, Mr. Rosenbaum was chasing me. I pointed my gun at him, and that did not deter him. He could have ran away instead of trying to take my gun from me. But he kept chasing me. It didn't stop him. Mr. Rittenhouse, you're telling us that you felt like you were about to die, right? Yes. But when you point the gun at someone else, that's going to make them feel like they're about to die, right? That's what you wanted him to feel. No. You wanted him to get the message from you that if you come any closer, I'm going to kill you. That's why you pointed the gun at him, right? I pointed the gun at him to deter him from, I, I pointed the gun at him so he would stop chasing me. That's why you, I pointed the gun at him. Because if you point the gun at him, you were hoping he would stop chasing you, you because he would get the message from you that if he keeps coming, you're going to kill him, right? I didn't want to have to kill Mr. Rosenbaum. I, that's not the question I asked. You, the it seems argumentative, Mr. Mr. Uh, he said it serves no useful purpose, it's badgering. Um, it does seem argumentative. You intended, in that sequence we just saw, you intended to point your gun back at Mr. Rosenbaum in the middle of the parking lot, right? I pointed it at him so he would stop chasing me, but he didn't stop. That I was could... your intentional decision to point at him. That wasn't an accident. You know, you know, I'm going to interrupt here. The jury cannot see you. I thought we'd moved it. I'm sorry. No, so please get it out of there. The point I'm trying to get at Mr. Rittenhouse is that that wasn't like an accidental turning around and it just happens to be pointing in his direction, much like I'm just happen to you know wave this around. You made an intentional decision in the middle of that incident to turn and point the gun at Mr. Rosenbaum, correct? Yes. And you can understand why that would make someone fearful for their life, right? But he continued to chase me after, so no, I can't. It didn't work. It didn't stop Mr. Rosenbaum from chasing me. And even after you shoot him one time and he starts falling, you continue to shoot three more times, right? I continued to shoot until he was no longer a threat to me. And then after that, you run around and he's lying there, face down on the ground, correct? Yes. And you're a medic, correct? I, I have first aid training, yes. Well, you proclaimed yourself that night to be a medic, an EMT. You told everyone that, right? Yes. And you had your medic bag with you, correct? Yes. And this location is right across the street from a hospital, isn't it? Yes. But your first thought was run away. My first thought was to help him. You didn't do anything to help him. You didn't do a single thing, did you? The crowd started to scream, get him, get him, get him. And I didn't want to stay there with the crowd building and the mob advancing on me. Were you surprised that a crowd would react that way when they just saw you shoot someone? I don't know. When you stood over Mr. Rosenbaum's body, did you yeah, know? I, I, I'm, I'm Go ahead. When you stood over Mr. Rosenbaum's body, did you know whether he was dead or alive? I didn't. Did you know whether or not it was possible at that moment to try and save him? I wanted to help Mr. Rosenbaum 
And if the crowd wouldn't have started screaming to get him, get him, get him, I would have stayed and did it. everything I could to help Mr. Rosenbaum. But the, the, the crowd just started to chase me and scream at me. Let's play, uh, can we have exhibit 14, please? At the three hour, 58 minute and 45 second mark. Okay, play from here, please. So the orders, the orders you hear about yelling no cameras, it was white boys. fired your four shots at Mr. Rosenbaum. There were three more gunshots right after that, right? Yes. And those were coming from very close to where you were, weren't they? Yes. They were coming from right here on the south side of the 63rd Street car source, right alongside 63rd Street on the north side of 63rd, right? Yes. You didn't react at all to those gunshots, did you? that time my audio was still going in and out partially. But again, my question is, you didn't react at all to those, did you? Not that I can see. Let's continue, please. Yeah. Shot him, man. Shot him. Shot him, man. He laid him out. He laid him out. He laid him out. No one in that crowd yells, get him, or anything threatening towards you until after you start running away, right? No. You had time in that moment to make a phone call, didn't you? I called Dominic Black, yes. You could have called 911, right? Yes. But you chose to call your best friend, right? I called the first number on my phone. Is that quicker than three digits, 911? I just, I don't know. And then you started running? Yes. And the first person you encounter as you're running is Jason Lakowski, correct? Yes. This is a person that you had barely known for 15 minutes that night, right? Yes. And you told him you didn't shoot anyone, correct? No. You heard his testimony about that, right? Yes. Can we please play exhibit number 12? While we're getting that ready, you talked earlier about this crowd and what they were saying and, and you felt like they were coming after you. You had time to stop and have a brief little talk with Jason Lakowski, didn't you? I stopped for a second and asked him to help me get to the police. Even with this crowd on top of you, as you describe it, you still had time for that, didn't you? For a second. It was, I stopped for a second. 
Let's play exhibit number 12, please. Up 10 seconds, please. Go ahead. Pause. There are people in the crowd that are asking you why you just shot someone, right? Yes. And you told him he had a gun. I. At the time, I was a little dazed, and I was thinking of Mr. Zeminski with the pistol he had at the Duramax. So you shot Mr. Rosenbaum because Joshua Zeminski had a pistol? No. You don't get to shoot someone else. You don't get to shoot someone else because someone else no. has a gun, right? No. But you told the crowd he had a gun, didn't you? That's what I said. And that wasn't true. Mr. Rosenbaum never had a gun, right? He, he didn't have a gun. Now can we please play exhibit number three at the one hour, 17 minute and 10 second mark? Courts. Facebook live stream that night. told Mr. Grosskreutz you were going to the police, right? Yes. And then you said, I didn't shoot anyone, right? I don't, I can't really make out what the last part of the words were saying. Do you remember what you said? I remember saying, I, I think I said I had to. Let's play that back 10 seconds and play it again, please. exact words, I'm going to the police, I did not shoot anyone? That's what I remember from that night, but 
watching that, it sounds like I said I didn't. That, again, was not true. You just had shot someone, correct? I did. Why didn't you tell the truth? I was being chased by a mob, and I don't really remember that interaction very well. Let's play Exhibit 5, please. This is the BG on the scene video. Go ahead. Pause. Now, we've heard a lot of testimony about this person who comes up behind you with something and hits you in the head. We've heard about Anthony Huber's first approach to you with his skateboard, correct? Yes. You testified that after a few more feet you felt lightheaded and you stumbled. That's what you told when your attorney was asking you questions, correct? Yes. No one knocked you to the ground. You lost your own balance, correct? I was hit to the point to where I stumbled. You said in response to your attorney's questions that you stumbled because you were lightheaded. Do you remember telling us that? From getting hit, yes. You were lightheaded because you had been running and you were being chased. That was why you were lightheaded, right? That and being hit, yes. Let's continue. Pause. There is an individual who comes at you and uh, jumps towards you and attempts to kick you, correct? He does kick me, yes. And you fire two shots directly at him with your AR-15, correct? Yes. You intended to hit him with those bullets, correct? I intended for him to. Yes. At that close range, it's a miracle that you missed, right? I don't know. You intended to kill him with those shots, didn't you? No. Did you even care? whether or not those two rounds were going to kill him? I didn't want to have to kill anybody that night. In this moment, you're making a deliberate decision to pull the trigger twice, correct? Yes. That wasn't an accident. That was your conscious decision, wasn't it? Yes. And you're firing an AR-15 at close range to this individual, correct? Yes. And you f knew full well that if you hit him with one or both of those bullets, it could kill him, right? There's that possibility. If you hit him with one of those, wouldn't you agree it's a pretty strong likelihood you're going to kill him? I don't know. If... Did that even factor into your mind at that point? Did you even care whether you were going to kill him or not? I, I didn't want to have to kill anybody. I was being attacked. That's why I shot him. Well, you shot at him. You shot at him with the intent of hitting him and killing him. Correct? I didn't want to kill anybody. Then why are you shooting at someone with an AR-15 at close range if you don't want to kill him? Because he's attacking me and he's stomping my face in, jumping that, and kicking my face in. That, you didn't see any weapons on that person, did you? No. You didn't see a gun? No. You didn't see a knife? No. You didn't see a bat or a club? No. You didn't see a chain? No. All he uses is one foot, correct? Yes. Let's continue the video. Pause. You've just shot a round into Anthony Huber's chest, right? Yes. Now, up until this moment, and probably for the rest of that evening, you didn't know the name Anthony Huber, did you? I did not. Up until this moment in this evening, you had never had any interaction with him, took any notice of him, fair to say? Yes. Okay. And when you shoot him, he's got his skateboard in his hand? 
Yes. You didn't see any gun in his hand, correct? No. You didn't see a knife? No. You didn't see a bat? No. You didn't see a club? No. All he's got is the skateboard, right? That he's hit me in the head with twice, yes. Okay. And you intended to pull the trigger at that moment with your AR-15, correct? Yes. That wasn't an accident. No. That was your deliberate decision, correct? Yes. And you knew that the way that gun was positioned, you were going to fire that bullet right into his chest, right? He was attacking me, so I pulled the trigger. And you knew that when you pulled that trigger, that bullet was going to go right into his chest, didn't you? I can't say. I don't know where the bullet would have went exactly. The end of that gun was pointed directly at his chest when you pulled the trigger, correct? Yes. And you knew that, correct? Yes. And you still pulled the trigger, didn't you? Yes. Because you intended to kill Anthony Huber at that moment, didn't you? No. What did you think was going to happen then? You got a gun that's aimed directly at his chest, you pull the trigger. What did you think was going to happen? If I didn't pull the trigger, I thought Mr. Huber was going to kill me. Maybe I misphrased my question. Let me try again. When you pull the trigger of the AR-15 and it is directly against Anthony Huber's chest, what did you think was going to happen to Anthony Huber? That he would no longer be a threat to my safety. Because he'd be dead, right? Because he wouldn't be a threat to me. I don't know if he'd be dead or not. Did you even care at that moment whether or not Anthony Huber lived and died? Yes. Your only concern in that moment was your own safety, correct? Yes. The next shooting is of Gage Grosskreutz. We have stopped the video at a moment here when he is crouched in front of you with his hands in the air, correct? Yes. Your gun is pointed at him, isn't it? It's pointed downward towards his feet. It's pointed at his body, some part of his body, correct? Yes. And he's no threat to you at this moment. Is he? Objection, Your Honor. He's standing in front of him with a gun. That's an argument you can make. I'm asking a question of the witness. You can ask a question. Yes. He's no threat to you at this moment, is he? He is a threat. He has a gun in his hand. You saw that gun? Yes. So at the moment, throughout all of these moments of your interaction with Mr. Grosskreutz, you were aware of the fact that he had that gun in his hand, correct? Not until that moment. I'm talking about from this moment on, correct? Yes. And of course, that's a handgun, right? Yes. And you have an AR-15, correct? Yes. And at this particular moment, he's not pointing his gun at you, is he? Not at that moment. But you've got your gun pointed at him, correct? Looking at the video, I think I'm lowering my weapon I think it's just a still shot of where you have it to where that, but I believe in the whole video I'm lowering it and then he points his gun at me. Can you help me understand, Mr. Rittenhouse, why Gage Grosskreutz, with a pistol in his hand, is a threat to kill you, but you, with an AR-15 pointed at him, is not a threat to kill him at this moment? Can you help me understand that? I've been attacked by several people and he decided to come and point a gun at my head. Well, first... Like he hasn't done that yet, has he? No. So again, I ask you, in this moment, you told us Gage Grosskreutz is a threat to you right now. Yes. He's got a pistol not aimed at you. You've got an AR-15 aimed at him. Why is he more of a threat to you than you are to him? because he was, a, he was moving at me with a gun in his hand. This is right after you've killed Anthony Huber, correct? Yes. Right after you fired two shots at almost point blank range at the man running towards the camera right now and missing him, correct? Yes. And you're telling us Gage Grosskreutz is the real threat at this moment? Yes. Can we please pull up exhibit number 80, beginning at frame 468? This is an exhibit.
exhibit, which consists of, what's the number, 732? 729 frames from the BG on the go video that we just watched. This was prepared by James Armstrong of the State Crime Lab. I'm not going to show all 729, but I'd like to start at frame 468, and we're going to go frame by frame from there until frame 500. Mr. Stute, could you please slowly advance frame by frame until I tell you to stop? Mr. Rittenhouse, this is immediately after Gage Grosskreutz has stopped in front of you and you are doing something with your firearm at that moment. Do you recall that? Yes. You were asked some questions about what you were doing at that moment. Is it fair to say that you turn your firearm over and you're looking at it, you're examining it? Yes. But your testimony is you didn't do anything to actually manipulate it at that moment. Correct. Is that fair to say? Correct. Okay. Please continue. Frame 500 shows you firing your AR-15 towards Gage Grosskreutz. At this particular moment, he does not have that pistol pointed towards you, does he? He does. His left leg has stepped across, in an, not directly towards you, but to the side of you, correct? Yes. He's reaching in with his left arm towards you, correct? Yes. He never steps back and puts the gun in both hands in a ready aim position towards you, does he? He doesn't do that. He never takes that gun with his right hand and stands there and holds it out with his right hand in front of him and aims it directly at you, does he? No, he does this pointing it directly at my head. And you thought that's the way he was going to shoot you? Yeah. You thought he ran up close to you to, to shoot you? Yes. You understand that he could have taken that gun if he wanted to and shot you from 10, 15, 20 feet away, right? Can you re Sorry, I'm have, trying to understand the question. You're, you understand that a pistol like that doesn't need to be right up close to someone to shoot, right? Yes. It can shoot from 10, 15, 20 feet away, right? Yes. Mr. Grosskreutz could have stopped 10, 15, 20 feet away if he wanted to shoot you and fired his pistol at you, couldn't he have? He could have, but he didn't. And your testimony is that you believed he ran up close to you and reached in with his left hand, with his gun in his right hand, because that was his way of using this gun to shoot you? Yes. Did you think he was reaching in to grab your gun? No. You didn't think he was going to take your gun away, did you? I thought he was going to shoot me. With his pistol? Yes. Which he never actually does, correct? Correct. He never fires that gun at you at all? No. In fact, in this entire sequence of events, no one ever fired a gun at you, did they? Right. Mr. Zeminski fired a gun from behind me. Did Mr. Zeminski fire that gun at you? I believe so. What do you base that on? Did you see it? The video. Did you see it? No. That's, you're talking about back when the incident with Mr. Rosenbaum happens, correct? Yes. That happened while you and Mr. Rosenbaum are running across the car source lot, correct? Yes. At that moment in time, 
You didn't see Joshua Zeminski fire a shot, did you? No. You heard a gunshot, right? Yes. But you had no idea who fired it. I believed it was Mr. Zeminski. So that gunshot did not at all factor into your decision to kill Joseph Rosenbaum, did it? No, Mr. Rosenbaum trying to steal my gun did. So you didn't think that was a gunshot from Joseph Rosenbaum? No. You knew he didn't have a gun? Oh, I see what your question is now. Okay. You, th you didn't think that the shot which had been fired supposedly by Mr. Zeminski had been fired by Mr. Rosenbaum? Exactly. Okay, okay. So you heard a gunshot. You now know that was Joshua Zeminski based on watching the videos, right? Yes. But at the time, you didn't think that was Joseph Rosenbaum firing that shot, did you? No. You knew Joseph Rosenbaum didn't have a gun, right? Yes. And you certainly would agree with me that you don't have the right to kill Joseph Rosenbaum for something Joshua Zeminski does, correct? Yes. When you heard that gunshot, you didn't know whether it was fired at you or up in the air or at Rosenbaum or anyone else, did you? I heard it from behind me, but I didn't. You didn't know where it was aimed? Correct. Correct? You didn't feel it hit you? Correct? Correct. You didn't hear it ricochet anywhere near you? Correct? Correct. You received no indication that that gunshot was going to put your life in danger? Correct? I don't know. There were gunshots going off all night long, weren't there? Sort of. Firecrackers, Fireworks, gunshots? yeah. Hard to tell the difference? Yeah. Right after you kill Rosenbaum, there's three shots right after that, aren't there? Yes. From very close to where you were? Yes. Yet you don't turn and shoot anybody there after you hear those, did you? No. So, getting back to my original question. In this entire sequence of events, no one ever fired a shot at you, did they? No. After you kill Anthony Huber, shoot Gage Grosskreutz, and attempt to f fire those two shots at the person who, who jumped at you, you got up and you walked away, didn't you? Yes. And you're about, what, a block away from the police line? Yes. And you know that police line's there because you're running towards it? Yes. And there's really nothing in the road between you and that police line, is there? At, after the shooting? Everybody no. scatters? No, nothing in the road. So you have a clear line of sight from where you did those shootings to those law enforcement vehicles, correct? Yes. And you still have your AR-15? Yes. And the crowd is pretty much run after they hear the sh sh shots, right? Yes. You still have your medic bag? Yes. Correct? Yes. You never once offer to help anybody that you just shot. Correct? I don't. Correct, you don't? Correct. Anthony Huber is lying there over on the ground after you shot him once in the chest, correct? Yes. You didn't know at that point whether he was alive or dead, did you? I didn't. You never went over to check, did you? No. You didn't know whether it was possible to save his life at that moment or not, did you? I didn't. And you didn't even care. You just kept on walking. Correct? I kept walking to get to the police line. Gage Grosskreutz, right after you shoot him in the arm, is yelling, I need a medic. Did you hear that? Yes. That's in the videos, isn't it? Yes. You don't do anything to help him, do you? No. You just decide to get out of there as fast as you can. Correct? Yes. If you had seen someone running up the street with a gun and the crowd was saying that that person just shot someone, like they were saying about you, you would have taken action to stop them yourself, wouldn't you? No, I wouldn't have. You're running around putting out fires, aren't you? Yes. 
A shooting's far more serious than a fire, isn't it? Yes. You took it upon yourself to do the things that the police and the fire weren't doing that fire departments weren't doing that night, correct? I helped put out fires, but I wouldn't say that. You went around offering medical service because you didn't think there were EMTs or EMS that would be able to come in there, correct? Yes. So you took it upon yourself to do the things that you didn't think the police or fire could do, correct? I wouldn't say I took it upon myself, but I, would, I was helping people with first aid and putting out fires at businesses. So if you saw someone running with a gun and everybody said, that guy just shot someone, you would have taken your AR-15 and tried to stop him, wouldn't you? Is it relevant to this, Mr. It goes to the crowd's reaction to him, Your Honor. I think he would have reacted the same way. The, the crowd is important in terms of it's a factor that bears on the some of the counts as to what the surroundings were. Uh, otherwise, the crowd is unimportant, and what the crowd, what he might have done vis-a-vis -vis the crowd is, uh, I, I don't see where we're going. Understood. When you got back to that police line, and they, what'd you say? They they pepper sprayed you. I believe so, but I don't remember it. They told you to get out of the road. Yes. Because they were going in there yes. to do what you hadn't done, which is to try and help the people that you just shot, right? Yes. And, you, and then you went after, back after that to the 59th Street car source, didn't you? Yes. And you told them that you just shot someone. Yes. Someone, meaning an individual person, correct? I wasn't meaning individual. I was saying I just shot someone. I just shot someone. You were told by Nick Smith that the police were coming to your location, to the 59th Street car source, right? I don't recall that. And yet, you decided to flee, didn't you? No. You didn't stick around for the police, did you? I, I went to go turn myself into the Antioch Police Department. A couple of hours later. An hour later. It wasn't a couple of hours, it was what time it was. I'm asking the witness if the witness can answer. Uh, go ahead, you can answer, sir. It was a couple of hours later, wasn't it? No. And in between leaving that location in downtown Kenosha and getting to Antioch, you were looking at social media, weren't you? No, I wasn't. My phone was dead. You had heard from other people that your name was out there, right? Later on in the evening, I believe I heard something, but no. You knew that your picture was out there, right? No. You're telling me, as you sit here under oath, that after those shootings, between then and the time you turned yourself into the Antioch Police Department, you had no idea that there was social media out there with your picture and your name as the shooter. I'm trying to recall, but... I, I can't... I'm, tr I'm trying to remember. I'm sorry, I don't remember. I have no further questions. Are you, right? on there, Your Honor. Uh, you may step down, sir. I need to use the men's room. How about a, about a five to ten minute break? Please don't talk about the case during the break. You may either use the jury room or you may remain down here uh, in the library.
There's a new report that we just received, okay? And I object to it. It's is beyond the scope of the court's order, and it's untimely. Is it, A, does it differ from the former report? Your Honor, the only thing that is different is it adds the new discovered video from Friday. And it also gives his opinions as to what the defendant was doing that night and his self-defense and um, what he was thinking and believing, etc., the pursuit, etc. There's a lot of opinions in here about uh, what the defendant was doing. The court's order. Well, on well this let me just let me just interrupt. Um, I think I stated that I would allow the um, imaging sequences, uh, the measurement of that, and I think I said I would allow the uh, observations he had made about um, the capacity of people to observe multiple objects. Uh, that's a poor way of summarizing it. That type of data, and when he talked about the car accidents, uh, and I think it was limited to that. So he may have left over uh, uh, impressions or opinions, but I, I don't expect I would be admitting any of that. And I'm not intending to. Okay. This, this new written report has those, so I am objecting. It should not be admitted into evidence or shown to the jury. All right. I, I don't expect it will be, and I, if he's offered it, um, unless he's got some ex uh, astonishing justification, then it won't be admitted because I said I wasn't. Thank you. Okay. Now, the question becomes, uh, how long will this take? Shame on me. It's 20 to 5. Yeah. It's been a long day, too. I don't know yeah. if you knew that. Um, but he's come here from Oregon, and you want to get him in. Well, no. I. You're available tomorrow, first thing. Okay. I don't want to start off. Right? I mean, uh, if you if I thought you could get your direct in in 20 minutes. Absolutely not. Then why don't we wait until tomorrow? Well, well, I shouldn't say that. Tell me what is expected course of the case after that, because it, I, maybe I would let you if it. Three. Raise your right hand. <laughs> um, that's what we have under subpoena. Well, Mr. Black is an under subpoena. We have um, Drew Hernandez and um, I think Bray to clear up the racking, the spent shell casings, and what evidence was recovered for you know, each I, I don't I thought Officer Van Wee testified to emptying the gun one at the hospital. At the, at the crime scene yeah. number two. Event right. number two. The state is saying that my client, Paige Grosswitz, rewrapped the gun. If there yeah, was a I understand that. And I thought that Officer Van Wee said that there were, there was a full, full except for eight shots, eight bullets. But there was... There was no, the word I'm looking for, live round found at event number two. So if there was a re-racking of that bolt, there would have been a live round. And oh, there see, I counted and I came up with with a full load, even without any bullet being found. And maybe I'm just, and additionally, that Mr. Grossquitz said he didn't know whether or not his gun had one in the chamber. Lukowski testified to it, and in fact, there is a live round right on the ground. Oh, this is so. This is what your third. Okay. Well, uh, let's deal with the realities of it. Uh, unless you gentlemen are prepared to tell me that you're going to send me your proposed instructions on uh, within uh, by four, like seven or seven or eight o'clock tonight. Uh, and unless you're going to tell me that you're going to argue for less than an hour and a half each, then we're going to end up either working Saturday or working on Monday. So let's take a vote here because the jury did clear Tuesday. And of course, 
I think I read once that Abraham Lincoln, when he was took a vote on the Emancipation Proclamation, all the votes were no. And then he said, well, he said, but the deciding vote is I. And so I'm going to take a vote about what you folks want to do, but that doesn't mean it's going to come out the way you want. So um, who wants to work Saturday? I'll work Saturday. I'll work Monday. I'll do whatever the court asks me. Who wants to come back on Monday? Okay. So it's one to un they don't care to I'm going to vote with you on Monday. So, uh, okay. So I know. I'm gonna, is it okay if I tell the jury we are hopeful that we will conclude the case on Monday? I understand that. Is there going to be extensive rebuttal? I don't think it's going to be extensive, but yeah. we do reserve the right to call sure. about Sure, yeah, I understood. Well, maybe I'll tell them I expect that we'll finish in the time which was given to us, which was included Tuesday. And we'll see what happens. All right. Anything else before I call the jury now? Oh, and then I'm going to dismiss them for the day. And um, we'll start in the morning with Dr. Black. Anything else? Do you want the instructions by 7? Is that what you would? Uh, yeah, you know, that would be cool. So email. E but if you, are you telling me that that would be cheap? No, I'm telling you that I'll, I'll do whatever you want. If you so. want by 8. Okay. And we're talking just about the count 6, right? Yeah, well. Yeah. I, you know what? I'll send you my preliminary. No, I won't do that. I'll send you my preliminary tonight. As long as we're not going to argument until next week. I'm not even going to promise that. Let's just... Cool. All right. Um, let's call the jury down. Dismiss them for the day. You don't have to send me anything tonight, and I won't send you anything. All right, folks. Uh, how many are in favor of my continuing to allow that light to flicker through the <laughs> remainder of the trial? Uh, why, don't we, uh, why don't we get maintenance in here and hopefully they can fix that. And um, we're going we're gonna to stop for the day. And we're going to uh, come tomorrow morning at, at 9. And um, I have just discussed the matter with the lawyers. And I'm very confident that we will finish... Uh, by Tuesday, as uh, I asked you about a couple weeks ago, and there's a bare chance, I don't want to get your hopes up, but there's a chance we could finish on Monday. Um, and that's the best of my information, and uh, it isn't any kind of, it isn't a promise, but uh, I'm, I think it's very real realistic. So, in the meantime, please don't read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Um, and, or uh, uh, read, yeah, or, or discuss the case with anyone, including members of your immediate household. And uh, any questions? See you tomorrow. I have to go upstairs, George. Yeah, would you go upstairs, please? And uh, the, uh, Mrs. Matasca Montink or her designee will talk to you.